All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the April 23rd, 2019 uh, Board of Supervisors uh, meeting, and I'm going to call the meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Good morning. Supervisor Leopold? Here. Bren? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. And Chair Coonerty? Here. Please join me in a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Palacios whether we have any late additions uh, or deletions to the consent or regular agenda. Uh, yes, we have a number of items uh, to correct. On the regular agenda, on item seven, there's additional materials. There's a letter from the California Coastal Commission. On item eight on the regular agenda, staff requests that this item be deleted. There's an addenda to the regular agenda Item 14.1, presentation from Cradle to Career Parent Leadership Committee as outlined in the memorandum of Supervisor Leopold. On the consent agenda, item 19, there's a correction. Item should read, introduce and adopt ordinances, one, amending Santa Cruz County Code chapters 1310 and 1320, establishing the Seascape Beach Estates Combining Zone District and amending Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 1310 by adding the, the SBE district to certain parcels, requires Coastal Commission certification after county adoption, and adopt the resolution accepting CEQA exemption determination, making findings of general plan, local coastal plan consistency, and, proving, and approving the minor variation to permit 4119-U. Public hearing held on April 16, 2019. <laughs> On item 23, there's additional materials, ADM-29, Karashoft Amendment. And on item 26, there's a correction. The item should read, award contract to paving construction services in the amount of 47,124 for the Center of Public Safety Repaving Project, set aside 4,712 for change order requests, adopt the resolution accepting unanticipated revenue in the amount of 51,836, and take related actions as recommended by the Director of General Services. On item 27, there's a correction. The item should read, award contract to ACO Wilson Incorporated in the amount of 127,219 for 1020 Emmeline server room cooling equipment project, set aside 12,722 for change order requests, adopt a resolution accepting the anticip unanticipated revenue in the amount of $140,000, and take related actions as recommended by the Director of General Services. There's actually an addenda to the consent agenda. 53.1, authorize the Chair of the Board to sign a letter of support for Senate Bill 276 authorized, authored by Senator Richard Pan, which would require the State Department of Public Health to develop a statewide standardized medical examination request form, require the State Public Health Officer to approve or deny a medical exemption request, require the department to create and maintain a database of approved medical examination exemption requests and to make the database accessible to local health officers as recommended by a supervisor's friend in Coonerty. And there's attached a bill, the text to SB 276, this fact sheet and vaccination school map attached as well. Uh, we've also added 53.2, direct the chair of the board to sign a letter to support Assembly Bill 1162 sponsored by assembly member Carla to ban single-use personal care products and hotel rooms as recommended by supervisor friend. There's 
the board memo printout and a bill text of Assembly Bill 1162. Thank you. Thank you. Keep, keep being busy this morning. Yeah. Uh, and just an announcement, we're gonna be hearing uh, item 14.1, which is the presentation from the Cradle to Career Parent Leadership Committee uh, as the first item on our regular agenda after the consent agenda. Um, so uh, now is an opportunity for members of the board to remove any items uh, from the consent agenda. No, no. Uh, remove or just comment? Uh, uh, first is to uh, remove. I won't remove. Okay, thank you. Um, now is an opportunity for public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about items that are on our consent agenda, on our regular agenda if you cannot stay, and on our closed session agenda, or items that are not on today's agenda but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, folks to line up if they would like to speak. Um, and can I see a show of hands for how many people would like to speak today on the consent agenda? All right, let's do uh, two minutes each and please line up if you can and come forward. Uh, my name is Tony Crane. I'm here representing a neighborhood in Aptos uh, in objection to a crisis mental health facility that was put in our residential neighborhood. Uh, the county and encompassing community services took a grant of $1.2 million that had a sole purpose for the capital acquisition of a property that would increase bed capacity in the county by two, meaning from six to eight beds. That was a mandate. Um, bef on August 21st, we had a meeting with officials from those two groups. They told us three distinct lies. Uh, that there was not a mandate to go to eight beds, licensing was not required, and that they had a two-year extension to make this work. None of, none of those are true. Uh, on August 11th, a neighbor emailed Zach and Monica uh, Martinez from Encompass asking, did they intend to increase bed capacity from six to eight? Monica didn't know the answer, so she emailed Eric Riera, uh, who was head of the mental health uh, department, um, asking for his input uh, on legislation and the answer to that. His answer was, and I quote, I think we can say the following. I think we can. Not at this point. The program has been highly su successful operating at six beds. And prior to making any changes, such as expanding to eight beds, we want to demonstrate that we will have no impact on the neighborhood and will be good neighbors. The grantor has given us an extension of two years before we need to look at expanding the number of people served in the program. Monica took that verbatim, except for the, I think we can say, cut and pasted it and sent it back to the neighbor. Nothing in that is true, not one thing. The grant was specifically for it to go to eight beds and they lied to us over and over again. I read something last week, they said there was no licensing required, yet in their internal emails, these are internal emails, they were talking about how it was mandated to get licensing and that they couldn't tell the neighbors otherwise we would find out. Put a stop to this, please. This is just ridiculous. You guys have had this information for a year and a half and you've re refused to do anything about it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Please feel free to line up if you're, if you're interested I, in speaking. Uh, my name is Suzanne Rust and I'm here to ask you to support SB 276, um, which requires oversight for, by the Department of Public Health for all medical exemptions that are um, provided by doctors for uh, patients who want a medical exemption for measles, mumps, rubella, vaccines. Um, Santa Cruz has an extremely low vaccination rate. We do not have herd immunity. We've had some cases of measles. Um, and we really need to look at why that's happening here. Um, some of you are too young to remember the polio uh, epidemic of 1953-54. Um, that's because we haven't had 
polio since the vaccines. Um, we haven't had measles. There have been 109,000 cases in the last year. That's up 300 percent globally over the last year. Um, we can prevent that. Measles is a completely preventable disease. Please vote for um, SB 276. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Thank you. <clears throat> I am Dr. Lincoln Russin, a retired physician. Mr. Do doctor, you can just lift this up, lift up the microphone if it's easier. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for hearing me. Uh, I would ask, the, ask your support for SB 276. This bill will require doctors to apply to the Department of Public Health if a patient wants a medical exemption. If there is adequate medical documentation, the department will issue the exemption. This will stop unscrupulous doctors from issuing bogus medical exemptions, and they're doing this for profit, and it will help stop the spread of communicable diseases that can be prevented by vaccines. Please support SB 276. Thank you. Speaker. Good, uh, good morning, uh, Chair Coonerty and honorable members of the board. My name is Dan Turbyfill. Uh, I'm here to speak in support of scheduled item number 14. Um, so I serve as a uh, consultant and trusted advisor for numerous commercial cannabis farms um, throughout California. I have a client who actually owns uh, farm properties here in Santa Cruz and in Mendocino County. We began working together last November. In that time, we've been successful in attaining local authorization from Mendocino County and secured a temporary state license for our Laytonville property, um, <clears throat> which last week we just submitted our annual, actually. In the meantime, we've built out and planted a 10,000 square foot grow. In that same period of time since November, we've met and completed a pre-application uh, here in Santa Cruz, which took about six and a half weeks to review before we had our site visit last Wednesday. So we've pretty much sat idle here. The state already has a robust regulatory framework. It would be wonderful if the county um, of Santa Cruz could align their policies with that. And we are so excited about the potential of increasing the number of licensees here and decreasing the amount of time it takes to get licensure. Uh, again, we're going to be left out this year here in Santa Cruz. On a side note, it's our intention to be a model farm for Santa Cruz and invite any of you to come visit our farm once it's up and running uh, to really see how a commercial cannabis farm runs efficiently and, and amazingly. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the board, I'm uh, Arnold Leff, uh, County Health Officer. Um, I'm here to speak about a couple of items. Uh, item number one is um, the meningitis B vaccine a proclamation uh, that your chair and uh, um, Supervisor Leopold uh, did sign and uh, becomes uh, effective tomorrow. Um, uh, it is critically important that people be aware of uh, meningococcal disease and the fact that there is two kinds and they're both vaccine, uh, uh, able to be vaccinated against. And we uh, are glad that uh, tomorrow will be uh, meningitis B vaccine awareness day. And we thank you for that proclamation. The other thing I would like to comment on is SB 276. You've heard some testimony uh, today with regard to that. It is critically important in Santa Cruz uh, that the state uh, be able to um, approve uh, medical exemptions for vaccines as uh, unfortunately there are some uh, physicians in the community who are um, giving uh, somewhat uh, fraudulent uh, medical exemptions, and we uh, need to uh, monitor that more directly. Senator Penn's bill will do that, and I appreciate uh, any support you can give for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning, Chair Coonerty and members of the board. Uh, my name is Mimi Hall. I'm the Health Services Agency Director for County of Santa Cruz, and I'm here to thank Chair Coonerty and Supervisor Leopold for signing the proclamation declaring tomorrow meningitis B Vaccine Awareness Day. As Dr. Leff mentioned, there are two types of vaccines against men meningococcal disease, um, but one of them against vaccine B, the vaccine B has only been around and approved by the CDC since 2015. So it's likely that many of us, including our children, are not vaccinated. Um, even with rapid and appropriate treatment, all kinds of meningitis can quickly progress to become fatal for an otherwise healthy person within hours of the first symptoms. And this is why prevention is critical. Meningococcal disease is spread through sneezing, sharing drinks, sharing food, even sharing lip balm. And studies have shown that freshmen living in college dorms are the most susceptible population. Vaccines are one of public health's greatest achievements in the 20th century, but with declining immunization rates, we're seeing a resurgence of vaccine-preventable diseases. And many parents don't know about this vaccine, um, and state law doesn't require that students receive this vaccine. However, education is encouraged. So today, for those parents who have lost their children to this disease, so unexpectedly in the prime of their lives, I urge everybody to be aware that this vaccine exists and encourage you to have your incoming college freshmen and other teens vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning, uh, Chairman Coonerty and honorable members of the board and the public behind me. Um, this weekend, the Santa Cruz Gem and Mineral Society is having its 68th annual Gem and Mineral Show at the Santa Cruz Civic. It's an all-volunteer organization, and this year is their 70th anniversary. They were formed in 1949, and I don't know if, how to go about this, but I was wondering if there's any way we can get some recognition for them because they have long issued scholarships to Cabrillo and, and uh, UCSC students. They've had a long relationship with Cabrillo that you could confirm with Dr. David Schwartz there. And I just think it's extraordinary that in Santa Cruz County, we have this all volunteer organization that's been maintaining a lapidary shop, teaching classes in jewelry making and leading rock hounding trips and doing this uh, since 1949. It's pretty cool. So that was all, I just, I'm not sure how to go about that. Um, just email me uh, and I'll see what I can do. Thank you very much, you appreciate might it. And uh, identify yourself for the record. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Michael Cox. I live in Soquel, I'm a member of the club, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Take Thank care. You. Honorable members of the board, good morning. Uh, my name is Caitlin Parkos, and it is a privilege to be speaking in front of you again today. Uh, I am a cannabis consultant and advisor for industry workers across this beautiful state that we call home. And today I'm speaking on item 14, uh, and I am encouraging you all to listen with fierce intention to the suggestions of the Cannabis Licensing Office. Their report is a fantastic outline of the reality of the systematic setbacks of cannabis cultivation in this county, and they know what they're talking about. That that dedicated staff down the hall from us right now have likely been on the receiving end of every frustrated and angry inquiry, and not only do they take every irrational comment in stride, they listen to the concerns and have allowed a respectable space for dialogue and uh, a di dialogue in discussing solutions. Again, they know what they're talking about. Um, from as many angles as probably possible. And they should be recognized and appreciated as the amazing resources to all of us. They are to all of us. I happen to think that this report shines brightest in exposing how uh, complex and unclear the process truly is. And I do hope that you recognize that, especially in this county. This county does fall tragically far behind other counties and even the state regulations that are in place. Um, and every item that they suggest affects a multitude of people, but I would like to stress the burden that the use permits review process truly is. An amendment to certain use permit reviews would be an immense burden lifted. I have worked with cultivators forced to put entire years worth of business on hold just to wait for this review. And there is no nobody who is not an advocate for this review process. We understand it, we respect it, we want to be in compliance with it. Um, and so we definitely agree on the importance of this step, but it's still a crop like many others and the cultivation review process should be equitable across all. 
I've applauded your efforts in the past, but I humbly ask for you to take this cannabis licensing office's recommendations very seriously. They are the best resource that you have to help Santa Cruz County be successful in cannabis. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Coonerty, members of the board. I'm Kimberly Peterson, Division Director for Employment and Benefit Services, and here representing the Human Services Department. I'm here to thank you for proclaiming the month of May as CalFresh Awareness Month. Throughout California, counties are using this opportunity to highlight the benefits of CalFresh food assistance. In Santa Cruz County, over 25,000 people are served by CalFresh each month with approximately half being children and 10% being seniors. CalFresh is part of a pathway to health and well-being for Santa Cruz County's youngest and most vulnerable adult citizens. Hunger negatively impacts the intellectual, physical, and emotional development of children, which can follow them into the classroom, resulting in poor academic performance. This year, the statewide theme for CalFresh Awareness Month is the CalFresh expansion to seniors and people with disabilities. Beginning in June 2019, for the first time in 45 years, recipients of Supplemental Security Income, or SSI, may be eligible for CalFresh benefits. In Santa Cruz County, we expect over 2,000 new households to be um, eligible for CalFresh following this policy change. This will allow residents to increase their food budgets, facilitating, facilitating access to nutritious food, and helping to reduce the risk of illness and chronic disease. We're training staff and partnering with IHSS and local community partners to reach out to the newly eligible population to enroll them into this important benefit. As you know, with extraordinarily high housing costs, every dollar counts, and CalFresh benefits can enable families and individuals to stretch their food budgets. This year, approximately 38 million in CalFresh benefits will be issued to county residents, though there are still individuals not accessing benefits for which they're eligible. So the department continues to work toward increasing CalFresh participation among all eligible households. We partner with Second Harvest Food Bank and other community-based organizations to raise awareness and educate residents about this important benefit. Again, thank you for proclaiming the month of May's CalFresh Awareness Month, and I want to thank EBSD staff for their uh, commitment and dedication to making a difference. Thank, thank, you. thank you. And I want to encourage anybody who might be listening today who thinks they might be eligible to uh, go to the website or call. It's a fast and easy process, and you may be entitled to several hundred dollars a month in benefits that can help uh, you and your family access healthy, fresh food. Uh, hi, my name is Wes Dewhurst, and I'm a cultivator in Santa Cruz. Um, well, a year ago I was a cultivator, now I'm an application submitter hoping to be a cultivator again. Um, I'd like to thank the board, staff, and the Cannabis Licensing Office for your hard work on the cannabis issues over the last several years. Um, I understand the Cannabis Licensing Manager will present a report on the progress of the licensing process today. I'd humbly ask the board to give the licensing manager the opportunity to present possible solutions to problems that have emerged, uh, as these solutions are far more interesting to me and many of us in this room than the problems themselves. So uh, I'd like to reiterate what this young lady said and to please give him some attention and listen to what he has to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Bruce Block. Um, I am a pediatrician currently practicing in our county. Um, I'm a member of the board of directors for Palo Alto Foundation Medical Group, and I am actually one of your first five commissioners. Thank you very much, Supervisor Friend. Um, I'm here to speak uh, in support of SB 276. Um, and um, though I didn't know it was tomorrow was meningitis B vaccine day, I'm uh, all about that as well. <laughs> um, I. Uh, thought a little bit about what I wanted to say to you guys this morning, and I, 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 I s have so many stories that I could tell, it's very difficult for me to choose one. Um, but um, I will say this, I, I see vaccine preventable diseases in unvaccinated people on a regular basis. Thankfully, I've only seen one case of measles in our county. Um, 
That was only half my time, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I don't want to see any more cases of measles. Um, we're, we're very lucky at this exact minute that we don't have measles cases in our county um, because we do have an unvaccinated population and a certain number of those people have been exempted inappropriately. There are medical reasons why people should not get vaccinated, but many people in our county have exemptions for non-medical reasons. Um, I want you to know that if there's somebody with measles in this room right now, anybody who's not vaccinated has a 90% chance of getting that disease, okay? That's way beyond many of the other uh, illnesses that we vaccinate for on a regular basis. Um, can, I, can I take 30 seconds about beyond this and tell you a quick story? A uh, quick one, yes. Okay, real quick story. I, I started my pediatric practice in Merced, California in 1993, and at that point there was a 60 or 70 year old nurse who was working with me, and her name was Jan. And it was my very first time being a clinic pediatrician, and I remember to this day Jan walking down the halls to vaccinate children, whistling. It was the happiest moment in her life when she could give shots to children. And I never really understood it until she explained to me that everything that she was vaccinating before for she had seen a child die from. And um, here we are 26 or 27 years later and I still have that memory imprinted and I just want you to share that with you guys. Please support SB 276. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Block. <laughs> Good morning. No Medicare for all jokes. Uh, Larry DiGataldi, <laughs> um, Larry DiGataldi, the Sutter CEO. Um, let me start by saying, you know, I've been practicing here since 1984. We've had a string of exemplary public health officers, and I just want to take a moment. We didn't know that the meningococcal issue was here. This man is beloved and respected, and we will miss him terribly. So, Arnie. Godspeed. Um, so let me tell you a story. In 1968, my mother, who was a family doctor running a, a, a university a hospital clinic in San Francisco, um, came home overjoyed. She came home and said, it has arrived. The vaccines have arrived. Uh, I saw two children die in, in the 1940s from measles. And the measles vaccine was distributed widely through North America, Europe, South America, and, and Asia. And unexpectedly, something happened that the public health people did not uh, anticipate. Uh, deaths in children from other infections dropped by half because measles as uh, in, ch in childhood essentially erases the hard drive of the immune system, leaving that child for many years susceptible to other infections. So the, uh, you know, these public health folks that come up with vaccines from polio in the 50s to measles in uh, the 60s or uh, for meningococcal disease in the last 20 years, God bless them, support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of rural Aptos Hills. Um, I'm here as the uh, chairman of the Fire Safe Santa Cruz County Public Education and Outreach Committee to um, let the public and the board know that May 4th is uh, National Wildfire Preparedness Day that is being proclaimed across the nation. And um, I would like to make sure that everyone knows we have a very active uh, fire safe council in Santa Cruz County, as well as individual fire safe councils in Bonnie Dune and up on the skyline, uh, the summit area. Um, May 4th is that day, but every day can be <laughs> and should be something that people should be who, in the rural areas especially, but also in the fringes, uh, because we've seen unusual fire behavior in California recently, to do their fire defensible space work. You can get a lot of information by going on the CAL FIRE website, on firesafesantacruz.com website, 
and you can also call your local fire agency for a free um, non-invasive inspection and they'll let you know what you need to do. Uh, people can sign up for free chipping programs at the Resource Conservation District and also on the Fire Safe Council website and we just recently got another grant to help with that good work. So we all need to be prepared and doing what we can to keep our homes and our communities and our beautiful woodland area fire safe. I would like to just jump over to the, um, the vaccination issue, and um, I think that vaccines are great. I think there are many children that should not get them, um, and I went to a, count, a symposium on autism a few years ago by the Nadherni Calciano group. The nation's specialist in autism divulged privately she did not vaccinate her own children because she saw too many times the pattern. The kid was fine, they got their shots, they came in with total inflammation and autism. So autism is on the rise and we need to examine this forced vaccination issue very carefully. Thank you. Good morning everybody. My name is Letitia Miller, and I'm not here for anything I've heard this morning. Uh, I got a notice, and I put it on my board. There was a meeting this morning uh, about an item, and uh, did I not get a notice that it had been canceled or rescheduled? No. So I got in the traffic, took me 45 minutes to get here. It would be nice if you would let your staff know. When they're gonna cancel a meeting, it would be nice to let us all know. That's why I'm here. Since you did drag me out of here, I'm gonna say one other thing. Over 30 years ago, when Jan Butes was uh, on the Transportation Committee as Board of Supervisor, I attended a meeting because she asked me to. And at that meeting, we discussed the traffic. And our suggestion was, let's put in some metering lights so we don't have 25 cars coming on at one time. I counted this morning when I was on Park Avenue, and here comes 15 cars. Everybody wanted to get on. It doesn't go one, one, one. Everybody, all 10 cars cut in. But that's why I'm here. The most important thing is let people People know when you take something off the agenda. Thank you for your time. Hi, good morning. My name is Drew Lewis. Um, I wanted to uh, draw our attention to a uh, subject here as a community that uh, issue that I think affects us all. It's about this uh, 5G uh, uh, rollout of this uh, microwave technology. I'd like to point out that uh, there's really well documented evidence that this is a very harmful technology. Uh, I will have these copies here for you that I'll leave with you. One is a Newsweek article uh, titled, uh, um, Parents concerned his fourth child diagnosed with cancer while attending California school with cell phone tower on the campus. Parents in Ripon, California say a cell phone tower in the local schoolyard is to blame for the cancer diagnosis of four students uh, and uh, also two teachers. Um, it's uh, been well, thousands of peer-reviewed studies by scientists independent of the industry conclusively prove serious long-term health effects from current exposures to wireless technologies, especially for children. These include cancer, neurological disorders, including ADHD, ADD, heart disease, sterility, including permanent DNA damage, diabetes, tinnitus, headaches, and insomnia. And I, I've heard people in the government say, oh, our hands are tied, we can't do anything about it. I will also leave you a document here uh, titled Lawmakers Hitting the Brakes on 5G. It shows uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, the city officials there have put a stop to it. Um, Italy, uh, Russia, Belgium, Germany. It goes on and on. So there's a lot of examples about how we can address this. I encourage you to uh, look at the documentation. I have a, um, another article here. Um, that's uh, a public health warning which we're passing out citywide to everyone and it's got uh, links on you can go to and one I highly recommend you see is is called um, <laughs> it's called uh, um, uh, 5G apocalypse the ex extinction event thank you good morning my name is Joel Campos I'm director of community outreach with me today 
Um, Andreana Fernandez, uh, Outreach Coordinator. We both work at Second Harvest Food Bank. Uh, we just want to raise awareness and let you guys know, which already did, uh, um, Kimberly already spoke to this. Um, May, it's CalFresh Awareness Month, and it's a it's a big month, uh, it's a big, big month uh, to raise awareness about CalFresh all throughout the county. We want to ask for your support, and we want to ask for your commitment to really get out there and promote this program, because as Kimberly mentioned, there is many, many uh, households, individuals, and kids that are going hungry every day. Uh, they are, uh, and they, because of, because of that, obviously, they're uh, struggling to perform good in schools and uh, other places. So it's very, very important for you guys to get out there, um, find uh, an event, and just talk about CalFresh during this month is very, very important. So we want to thank the partnership that Second Harvest has uh, with HSD. Uh, it's really, really uh, important. We're doing a lot of events. One of the highlights, so a major event is CalFresh, uh, the CalFresh Forum that we do it every year. And it's, uh, we're having it at uh, City Plaza in Watsonville, May 17th, uh, from 8 to 1. You guys are more than welcome to come. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Miles Taylor. I'm speaking on the scheduled item 14. I'm here as a cannabis cultivator and as a representer of our commercial cannabis uh, cultivation and distribution operation in South County. Uh, we're grateful for the staff and the board's work to date on the issue of licensing and today look forward to hearing staff recommendations on the land use process for commercial agriculture growers such as our operation. Thank you all. Thank you. I'm Pat Boyle. I'm a mother and grandmother, and I live in Soquel, near Soquel Village, the place uh, where uh, there's the tire place, where there's going to be two cell towers on top of that tire place. Uh, please do not put those cell towers, because the children from the Santa Cruz High School come down every afternoon and go to all the restaurants and they eat their lunch, and those cell towers are right going to be there, right in front of them. There's the children in the uh, elementary school that are innocent with clean minds, and from uh, I have life experience of uh, radiation because I lost a son of 25 years old in 2004 of numerous brain tumors. He was always on his cell phone. First it was the, the um, I don't know what it's called, where they put a number in and he had that first to get in touch because he was a way of being in touch with his family. I have another son with paranoid schizophrenia. And the cell phone did not help him. At 33, he really lost it. Now he's 37, and he's now in jail. He, he had a very bad experience thinking that people were zapping him with the cell phones, and he hurt somebody, and now he's in jail. And these are things that have happened to my children, and I don't want the young children to be exposed to this radiation. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Jay Rosella Myers, and I've been a resident of Santa Cruz County. On purpose, I chose this location because I felt like it was a healthier place to live, and I already am suffering from major nosebleeds and stuff from the radiation that we already have in our community. And I think it's really important to pay attention to not create more problems health-wise that we don't really understand yet and please please look at the information that's provided to you and carefully carefully evaluate what uh, you need to know to make decisions about the health and welfare of our community members and the future of our children so please for the sake of yourselves and your own health and the future of the health of the people who choose to live here I really thank you for your consideration and please please do take it seriously thank you yeah, I, I have a thank question you. here 
Uh, sure. Yeah, 5G, is that on the consent agenda? What are we? It's uh, not, I, th I believe they're speaking to us uh, on uh, public comment about public items comment. that are. There, okay. there was originally scheduled a, um, uh, an appeal that was supposed to be brought to us uh, about a, sure. a cell tower in Soquel for this date and that got changed. I don't know what the new date is. But I don't but some see pe the Some appeal. people have shown up for that. Okay, that's not today though. <coughs> no. Not today. All right. Okay, no, thank you. All right, well that concludes public comment and I'll bring it back to the board for action on the consent agenda uh, and offer up uh, opportunity for public comment. So Supervisor Caput. You bet, okay. Um, <coughs> let me see where I am here. <coughs> yeah, on 53.1, uh, uh, this is, uh, I, I'm opposed to this and uh, it's for a number of reasons. Uh, so when you listen, uh, we have doctors that disagree. I know some doctors, they stand up and they disagree on one thing and uh, maybe the rest of the great majority agree on another thing. Um, whenever we're talking about mandatory, the next step is uh, forced. And uh, this is almost uh, not only trying to get every parent and child in line like a herd in order to be uh, vaccinated, but it's also uh, aimed at getting doctors in line and making sure that they uh, can't disagree with the, uh, the majority of other physicians. Um, I heard uh, some comments where uh, the doctors who do that disagree on uh, mandatory uh, vaccinations, that they're fraudulent, uh, bogus, and unscrupulous. Uh, when, when, uh, when you say that about somebody who disagrees with you in your profession, that is going to come back and they're going to, somebody can say that about you when you disagree with the majority of the other uh, physicians. I believe in parental rights and I also believe in uh, um, uh, not having every rule and every law uh, forcing parents and forcing everybody to get in line <coughs> or to cooperate. Okay, so I am voting no on, uh, I believe it's 53.1. 53, 53 okay, thank you. Yeah. Supervisor McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, there's several items I just wanted to comment briefly on. Uh, numbers uh, 27 and 28, the contracts awarded for uh, repair of the MLI buildings. I'm happy to see that the general services is able to implement uh, repairs to county facilities. We've had a long list of deferred maintenance items in the county. And uh, if we continue with that, uh, it's gonna cost us much more in the long run, so I'm glad that we're able to get to those items on MLINE. Uh, and item number uh, 34, uh, it's just a grant application, but it is for a million dollars to expand the Sheriff's Recovery Center. Uh, this facility really has been instrumental in uh, reducing the need and cost of using our jail as an emergency and emergency rooms to deal with uh, people who are under the influence. I, I uh, think this will be a real tremendous asset for us and I hope we have good luck in uh, receiving that million dollar grant application. Um, on number, uh, item number 38, I, th I think it's, uh, it's regarding general assistance aid payments. Uh, I think it's important to note that Santa Cruz County general assistance payments are in the alignment with other counties in the state with similar demographics and cost of living. Our, um, I often hear that uh, oh, the county gives more in general assistance than anybody else uh, has to and uh, that's just not the way it is. We, uh, our county's monthly payment of $391 is in the middle of range of payments to similar counties in California. Uh, the good news is the number of folks on general assistance in Santa Cruz County is going down. Uh, the, the staff uh, also works hard to transition eligible clients to SSI rather than general assistance, which is a better, better for them uh, to save uh, the general uh, fund of Santa Cruz County. So I, I think it needs to be clarified that we don't give more than general assistance uh, uh, by, uh, we're just in the median of it and uh, we're not the welfare county of, of California is what I want to say, uh, that some people have an idea that that's the way it is. Um, number 46, an update on the Boulder Creek Library pr Project. I want to thank the Public Works Department uh, and the Capital Project staff uh, for continuing to ensure the project continues to make progress. Uh, we've had well-attended community meetings on that. Uh, the Felton Library is well 
uh, uh, under um, construction now, and uh, we will not see the, Boulder, the improvements to Boulder Creek Library start until early 2020 because that's when the Felton Library uh, will be uh, up and operational in early 2020, and we didn't want to have both libraries closed at the same time. Um, on items 50 and 52, uh, the FEMA-funded storm damage and SB1-funded road repairs, um, this is just an, even an incremental step we take to improve our system of roads. And I want to thank again the voters of Santa Cruz County for voting yes on uh, or for supporting uh, Senate Bill 1 twice uh, and by saying no to Proposition 6. Um, that uh, was going to, it was a referendum to uh, eliminate that. Uh, without this support of this long list of over $200 million of needed road repairs in this county would, would not be addressed in the fashion we're able to do it now. Uh, we have a long road to go. And everybody uh, I understand thinks the road in front of their house or close to them um, is the most important one, and that's understandable. But uh, we really we are really making our very good um, effort to improve the roads most highly traveled and our 600 miles of roadway in the unincorporated area. And I think that the uh, Public Works Department is to be committed to do as much as they can with what they have, and it's really a welcome uh, to have additional revenues from um, our Measure D that uh, county voters approved in November of 2016 and the, uh, the sales tax on uh, gasoline that was approved by the state. Um, I went there with that, that's uh, all I have to say, but, but thank you very much for your support of uh, helping us address the much needed improvements that we have to have in Santa Cruz County for our road system. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning. Uh, just a couple of items uh, on item 16, which is the board minutes from April 16th. I'm going to abstain because I was not at the meeting. Um, on item number 35, uh, I'm glad to see this uh, report from the alcohol nuisance abatement program. Appreciate all the hard work that's going into that program. The, the measures uh, that we're looking at uh, seem to be good one and they're, uh, most of them are moving in the right direction. So I appreciate the, the hard work that our sheriff's department is putting into that program and I think we're gonna uh, see greater benefits over time. Um, on uh, item number uh, 51, I'm glad to see that we're going out for a request for qualifications to look at the long range facility and campus master plans for both this site and our Watsonville site, uh, trying to figure out how we can use our land uh, to better meet the needs of the community, whether it be through services or housing, is a, is a, a great step forward and, and very uh, uh, greatly needed to here in our community. And uh, I'm glad to see this uh, uh, moving forward and I look forward to more information as this process continues. On item number 52, I'd just like to add an additional direction um, this is the item about Senate Bill 1 and uh, the projects and the, and the dates in which they're going to be done. I'd like this to, to come back to us in October with uh, any changes, uh, this same list, but if there's any changes in dates to, to mark those and explain why those dates are being changed. Uh, I think the community counts on these dates and when they get changed, it's good to have the information um, about it. Uh, oh, I, I guess the last thing I'll say is on item number 53.1, I'm glad to support Senate Bill 276. I appreciate my colleagues for bringing this forward. Um, uh, the need for vaccinations is real. The information uh, about vaccination is generally false. Uh, the uh, to tying it to autism is, is uh, something that was discredited many, many years ago. The doctor uh, that uh, uh, did that study not only had the study removed, but he lost his license. Um, it, it doesn't, not only does it not help in terms of uh, promoting good public health uh, by using that scare as a, um, um, uh, as a reason for people not to get vaccines, but it's also a great disservice to the autism community that somehow um, that they are um, uh, greatly uh, uh, affected and that, that it's something we should um, uh, be worried about rather than looking at the neurodivergent way in which uh, 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 people's brains are wired. And so uh, I, I strongly support this bill as we did the last one and I look forward to um, increasing the uh, immunity rates uh, here in Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Prime. Thank you. So I'll just briefly comment on item 53.1 and 
to I understand uh, my colleagues uh, concerned Supervisor Caput. I, I respectfully disagree uh, with them and the states and communities across the country that have uh, made these exemption changes there have been significant declines in the number of preventable diseases I mean in my opinion uh, to claim that there is a scientific debate over the efficacy of vaccines is sort of like saying that there's a, a valid scientific debate over the uh, over whether climate change is real I, I don't really think uh, that any uh, bona fide scientist or physician really actually questions whether or not these things work. I mean, I, we can always point to one or two outliers, but uh, if I had a hundred doctors tell me that my uh, four-year-old son needed a certain treatment and the hundred and first said something different, I wouldn't put all of my eggs in that hundred and first doctor. I think that overall uh, we really take a significant risk as a community and as a country when we allow ourselves to uh, Google our answers as opposed to trusting science. So I'm totally supportive of that item. On item 53.2, I'd just like to uh, thank actually my colleagues on this because this is our item on our local hospitality ordinance that very quickly has become a statewide bill. In fact, they're actually modeling it almost verbatim after our ordinance and, and that's uh, a real testament to the work of uh, Tim Gontroff and Public Works, uh, Save Our Shores and others, but people that took a lead, for all of you that were willing to work with, uh, with uh, Supervisor McPherson and myself on this, and uh, we have been in close contact with Assemblyman Member Calra, and it does look very positive on how things are going across the state. So I appreciate your work within just a few months of us passing it, it's now looking that it'll become a statewide policy. Thank you. Just a couple brief comments. On item number 29, uh, we have the Davenport Landing bathroom. I wanna thank uh, our parks uh, director, Jeff Gaffney, for bringing this forward. Uh, sometimes it's the little things that matter a lot, and, uh, and I appreciate your effort. Yeah. Do you? Yes, sir. Supervisor Coonerty. Oh, no, I was just thanking you. <laughs> Sorry, oh, thank you so much. Yeah. I, I also, <laughs> <laughs> I have a cold, I'm on medication, forgive me. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> thank you. Uh, that's a thank you. Um, on item number 47, uh, on uh, May 18th, the Davenport May Festival, uh, just to encourage the community to go out and check it out. Great food, great dancing, uh, a wonderful community celebration. On item number 39, I wanna thank uh, the Human Services Department for working to get Cal more CalWORKs money for housing support, for uh, helping working families who are experiencing homelessness find housing. And on item number 53.1, uh, I wanna thank everyone who came out today and gave testimony. Um, when you look at some of the vaccination rates in some of our schools, there's a potential public health crisis that's significant, um, and that crisis can impact lives. I also think it's uh, more and more important for people to step forward and put uh, focus on truth and try to counter some of the misinformation that spreads so rapidly uh, and seems to hijack our public debates and so uh, bringing this forward is both the support of this important bill and the public health of our community, but also hopefully a small pushback uh, against uh, fake news that, that uh, has tremendous impacts on our, on our world right now. Uh, so I'll ask for a motion. I'll move the consent agenda as amended with Supervisor Leopold's abstention on item 16 and Supervisor Caput's no vote on item 53.1. Second. Right. So uh, that, that'll be noted. So when I vote aye, uh, I'm voting no on 53.1, okay. Okay, so we got a motion by friend and a second by Leopold. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously with the exception of the no vote on item 53.1 and the abstention by Supervisor Leopold. Uh, so moving on, we are now gonna take item number 14.1. This is a presentation from the Cradle to Career Parent Leadership Committee as outlined in a memorandum uh, from Supervisor Leopold. Um, introduce the item. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, uh, there was a delegation uh, led by uh, county staff member Leslie Goodfriend to go check out the Harlem Children's Zone in New York City uh, because they were doing something very interesting about using their collective impact to make a difference in a community in, in Harlem, uh, New York. Uh, I wasn't able to go on that trip, uh, but they brought back great information. And seven years ago, we started meeting about trying to figure out how we could do something like that here in, in Santa Cruz. Five years ago, we actually started doing it. Um, and we started at Live Oak Elementary, uh, 
and it was a great collaboration of both the human services department and our human services agency, uh, the community uh, foundation, the Santa Cruz Community Health Center, First Five, uh, Encompass, and the Live Oak School District. Um, all these partners played an incredible role in trying to think about how uh, they could all do a, a better job uh, about meeting the needs of families in Live Oak. Um, Live Oak is this, uh, uh, is an unincorporated community where there's great wealth and great poverty within a few blocks of each other. Um, the, 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 the leadership from the school district, the leadership from the health center, the leadership from the county and the other agencies um, that were, was all critical because not only did they have great resources, great minds and great commitment, but they also were smart enough that they didn't have all the answers. Um, and uh, a parent leadership group was formed at Live Oak Elementary, which has been the leader of this effort. This is a parent-driven initiative to improve the lives of families in uh, Live Oak. And uh, we'll hear more about it in a moment, but I just want to say that um, Live Oak is really the spearhead of the demographic change that we're looking at here in Santa Cruz County. And the success that we have in addressing concerns in Live Oak will provide a great template for us to address uh, needs in our community uh, countywide. And uh, so I'm very excited about this. I'm in awe of the parents who've stepped up in leadership position, and I'm grateful for the support of so many uh, great organizations and departments who have helped make it happen. I look forward to the presentation. Good morning. This way. Okay. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Leslie Goodfriend, and I want to thank you for welcoming us to speak with you today about our Cradle to Career initiative. I'm a senior health services manager with the Human Services Department, and I'm a member of the Cradle to Career Steering Committee. We're honored to have the opportunity to speak with you today about our Live Oak Cradle to Career initiative. I'd like to take a moment and ask those of you who are part of the Cradle to Career initiative to please stand and be recognized for a moment. Thank you. As Supervisor Leopold said, Live Oak is home to multi-million dollar houses, yet there are also pockets of poverty interspersed within just blocks of each other. At Live Oak Elementary School, 85% of the children are on free or reduced school lunch, and a quarter of the students are characterized as homeless. To address these challenges, the Live Oak Cradle to Career Initiative was formed in 2014 by parents, educators, health and social service leaders working together to ensure that all Live Oak children can reach their full potential. Oh, there we go. We sought the leadership of parents to guide this initiative from day one. We asked parents what their hopes and dreams were for their children, and they told us they wanted good health, good character, and good education. To be successful in engaging all parents, we added our next ingredient, authentic inclusion in all that we do. By shifting from a service model to an organizing model, our Cradle to Career initiative sees all parents as partners. We don't wait for parents to come to us. We meet them where they are, at school or in the community. The parents are strong advocates for their children and families and have spoken before your board on several occasions, participated in lobbying events, visits to our state legislatures, and spoken to the Live Oak School District trustees in the Soquel Water District. <coughs> Live Oak School District is proud of recent academic data, which shows that the percentage of Live Oak third graders demonstrating proficiency on the state's English language arts test has increased over the past three years, rising from 51% in 2015 to 66% in 2018. This is greatly surpassing the state average of 48% for 2018. You will now be hearing directly from our parent leaders about the impact of Cradle to Career that it has on your, their families. Diana and Reina from Live Oak Elementary School and Devin and Yadira from Del Mar.
Hola, buenos días. Mi nombre es Diana Valadez y soy madre líder de Cuna Carrera por tres años seguidos. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Diana Valadez. I'm a mother and a leader at uh, Cradle to Careers for the last three years. Gracias a todos por escucharme. Thank you for listening to us today. Yo hablaré hoy del tema de la salud. I will be speaking to you about the health issue. Quisiera compartirles un poco de los logros que hemos venido obteniendo poco a poco. I want to share with you a little bit about the, um, oh my goodness, sorry. Achievements that we have had uh, little by little. Soy una persona que lucho día a día por mi salud y bienestar para estar fuerte para mis hijos y para mi familia. I am someone that struggles day to day for my health and my well-being to be strong for my children and for my family. Estoy sufriendo hace un año cinco meses de una enfermedad llamada mastitis de mi seno derecho. I have been suffering for the last year and five months from an illness called um, mastitis um, of the breast. <coughs> Una situación muy dolorosa y lo peor es que no sé cuándo terminará este sufrimiento. It's a very difficult situation and the worst thing is that I don't know when this will end. Y conversando con otras madres de familia, ellas también empezaron a abrir su corazón y platicar sobre sus problemas y necesidades. In speaking with other mothers and families, they started to open up and share heart to heart about their um, problems and their necessities as well. Quizá platicaban con más confianza porque somos una comunidad de madres fuertes con grandes corazones y sentimientos vulnerables. It's possible that they opened up and spoke more openly because we're a tight community of mothers, we're strong and we have great hearts and are, sorry, sentimientos? and our feelings are quite vulnerable. Fue ahí donde al escuchar tantos testimonios, se me ocurrió la idea de comentar con el equipo de Cuna Carrera y ver si podían brindar apoyo a las madres que no tienen el, un seguro médico y los suficientes medios. It was then after listening to so many different testimonies that I had the idea to comment to, uh, to the group of the, um, from Cradle to Careers to see if they could help this group of mothers that didn't have health um, insurance. Yeah, they didn't have the health insurance or the means for the treatments. Para poder costear los gastos necesarios. To cover all those necessary um, costs. Se formó un comité de salud y entre juntas y pláticas y hoy en día hay varias agencias que están trabajando y brindando su apoyo. We formed a committee and between meetings and conversations, nowadays there's many agencies that help work that are helping us and giving us their support. También quiero comentar del programa Pasión por los Productos que se formó a raíz de una junta que tuvimos para preguntarnos qué era lo que la comunidad necesitaba. Sorry. Go ahead, Francis. Sorry. Uh, also, I want to let you know about the program um, called Passion, Passion for Our Products. Uh, this was formed. This was, this was formed uh, the the meeting that we had, uh, the, the meeting that we had with the community. Entonces opinamos que sería bueno que tuviéramos clases de zumba en nuestro programa. And then we decided that it was a good idea to have zumba classes in the program. Era buena idea que nos proveeran clases de nutrición y pudieran darnos ayuda con los productos. It was, it was a great idea that, he, that they can provide, uh, provide us uh, a nutrition classes. 
and they can help us with the products, with the products that they offer to the uh, book through the um, book, um, the food bank. The food bank. Y me da gusto compartirles que hoy en día llevamos recibiendo estos beneficios por poco más de un año. And I'm, and I'm glad to share with you all that we're very happy that all this, uh, that we are receiving all these benefits for more than one year. Clases de Zumba, de nutrición y repartición de productos. Uh, so, we, uh, so we got uh, the Zumba classes, uh, the, um, the nutrition class. The nutrition classes and and we all have um, and we received, the received the products, the free products. Y alrededor de 60 a 70 familias son beneficiadas dos veces por mes. And uh, about 60 to 70 families are have benefited from this from the last for the last two months. Mm -hmm. Y estoy orgullosa de saber que escucharon mi voz. And I'm very and I'm very proud that I that to know that everyone listened to me. Esperamos seguir creciendo y desarrollar más actividades para seguir manteniendo activos a nuestros hijos. We hope to, uh, we hope we to, hope to continue, continue, continue to grow, to grow and develop more, more activities to be able to help our, uh, our kids in our community. Esperamos seguir contando con su gran apoyo y así nuestra comunidad siga creciendo y formar más lazos entre unos y otros. Muchas gracias. We, we hope to count with your support for so our community. We, oh, I'm sorry. So our community can continue to grow and form more, more connections between all of us. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. I apologize, it was kind of a last minute, I but know. we are trying to do our best to translate. I know. Sorry. I know. Absolutely, thank you. Buenos dias, mi nombre es Reina, y mi nombre es Reina Calvillo. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Reina Calvillo. Y mi tema es este, el, el buen carácter. My topic is good character. Soy madre de cuatro hijos. I am the mother of four. Me gustaría compartir mi experiencia en el programa. I would like to share my experience with the program. En, de Cuna Carrera. Of the program from Cradle to Careers. Ya que formo parte del Comité de Padres Líderes. As I am part of the Parent Leaders um, Group. Yo me he beneficiado mucho de los talleres de Triple P. I have benefited plenty from the uh, program. Talleres. Talleres. De Triple P. Um, uh -huh. The Triple P programs. Y de liderazgo. And leadership. Estos talleres han traído mucho beneficio. These programs have brought many benefits. En lo personal, <coughs> en, en cuanto a la relación con mis hijas adolescentes. Personally and as well as with the relationship that I have with my daughters. Me siento más fuerte para ayudarlas. I feel much stronger to be able to help them. A enfrentar todos los retos que tienen que enfrentar día a día. Deal with all of the challenges that they will face day to day. Tanto físicos, emocionales y académicos. Physically, emotionally, and academically. Y especialmente de que se den cuenta del gran potencial que ellos tienen. And especially for them to realize their great potential. Ayudarlos a luchar por sus sueños y metas. Help them achieve their goals and dreams. Sabemos que, que no será fácil. We know it will not be easy. Pero el programa de Cuna Carrera. But the program of From Cradles to Careers. Nos da las armas necesarias para motivarlos y guiarlos. Gives us the necessary tools. 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 Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, para motivar. To motivate them. En guiarlos. And guide them. Para que se preparen académicamente. So that they can prepare themselves academically. Para que en el futuro tengan tengamos so that in the future we have una comunidad enriquecida de educación and in which community in education y especialmente de nuestros valores and especially for our values y pues quiero agradecer en nombre de las familias que han sido beneficiados por estos programas i want to say thank you in the in name of the families that have benefited from this program y que tengan muy buen día and have a good day Good morning. Good morning. My name is Yadira Canizal. My name is Yadira Canizal, 
Y, y agradezco mucho su tiempo y atención en esta mañana. Good morning. My name is Yadira Canizal. I appreciate your time this morning. I'm. And a pinch. Estoy muy asombrada. ¿Sí dijo eso ya? No. Ok. No, ok. Yo también estoy asombrada. Estoy muy emocionada de ser parte de una carrera como madre líder en representación de Delmar Elementary. I'm, I'm very um, honored to be uh, here today in representing the, um, as a mother, as representing the community uh, from Del, Delmar Elementary. Hoy estoy aquí para hablar sobre la buena educación. I'm here today to talk about the good education. Tomando en cuenta que la educación es un proceso educativo de asimilar y aprender. Uh, keeping in mind the, the education and is the process of a successful education. education and learning series. Mm -hmm. Okay. Una serie de, de habilidades y valores que producen cambios intelectuales. Así es. Es. Quiero terminar. It's a series of qualities and values that can change intellectuals emotionally and socially. En una carrera, creemos que la buena educación comienza desde temprana edad. En Cradles to Careers, we believe that a good education starts at a very early age. Y así nació la necesidad de incluir, al, inclu, inculcarle a los niños el amor por los libros desde la edad preescolar. That's how the uh, necessity to, that is why there's a necessity to instill in children the love of books at a very early age. Y se introdujo el programa Raise a Reader. And the program Raise a Reader was introduced. Que consiste en entregarle una bolsa de color rojo a cada familia una it, vez por semana. Sorry. sorry. It consists of giving a family once, cada semana? Yes. Every week a red bag which includes a book Four books. Four books. Sorry. Thank oh. you. No. <laughs> Four books. For each family. Perdón. No, sir. Ya no estoy. Por cada familia. Una vez por semana. Sabiendo que a, a esta edad, por lo general, los niños no, no son capaces de leer. Even knowing that um, at that age, generally, children cannot read. Entonces, los padres tienen que leerle a los hijos. So because the children are unable to read these books, it's important that the parents read these books to the children. She's going to finish off. So then we think that because the parents can be able, the kids can be able to read, the parents are going to be invo involved in that situation. And then it get a connection between father, son, and education. And without knowing, the, the, the family is involved in that situation and 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 it's not only the love for the books for the kids but also the parents getting involved and so we we believe in cradle to career that when we have a strong children with good education and the parents involved in the lives of those children we're going to raise strong kids with a foundation really good foundation in the education and it's going to be the key and in the way and, and it's going to be the path for that for that and, and the key for open all doors that is going to be able for them when they have a good education thank, thank you, you so much thank you yeah. totally agree <laughs> hello uh, my name is devin mcdine i have two kids in the live oak school district i am a parent leader at delmar elementary um, what Cradle to Career has done for me is just made me realize how many people in the schools and in the community care about our kids and their education and how um, they're going to turn out. We want to we want to raise good kids and we want to start now while they're really young um, and be 
involved as early as possible. That's what it's done for me. It made me feel like I have a voice and I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of um, the administration and staff in the school district and all of our partners that have supported us, uh, the Cradle to Career group. Um, it's just really eye-opening to know that so many people actually care. Uh, we would like to invite each of you. Every year we have um, an annual fiesta. At, it's going to be at Live Oak Elementary. We would like to invite each of you and your families. It's on Thursday, May 9th at 5 p.m. We will be honored if you could come and just get a glimpse of what we do and what our uh, group is like when we're all together. It will be very fun, and we really hope that you can come. Thanks so much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So uh, that concludes uh, the presentation. Um, this is really an incredible program and kudos to everyone who's been so involved. Uh, I was there the other night when you all won an award from the Health Improvement Partnership uh, for uh, the great effort that this uh, program makes in improving the health of not only the kids in Live Oak, but in t the entire community. Um, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, Chair, I would just, uh, I also want to say a special thanks to the Live Oak School District who has embraced this program um, and has really made it great. Uh, it would be impossible to do without the Santa Cruz Community Health Center or the East Cliff Family Health Center, who's been an amazing addition in a community of 25 to 30,000 people. F five years ago, we didn't have one doctor's office. Now we have uh, over 9,000 patient visits uh, a year in Live Oak. Uh, and we're going to grow it with our uh, n uh, with a new clinic on uh, on Capitola Road, and the first five program has uh, been providing uh, programming in uh, Live Oak for many years, and they have um, uh, very uh, uh, gracefully uh, assimilated into this program, provided great information, and used their triple P and raising a reader workshops to really help um, uh, address the needs of parents. And most particularly, uh, what we see here today is uh, f uh, four mothers who are active parts of the Parent Leadership Council, but there are lots of other members of the Parent Leadership Council, um, and it's a very active and involved group who is not just waiting to be told what to do, but is actually leading and, and helping uh, us leverage the work that uh, all these agencies are doing to better meet the needs of families in uh, Live Oak. So I just give a lot of credit uh, to these powerful women who are doing incredible work, not only for their families, but for Live Oak and for Santa Cruz County as a whole. Um, there's a lot more going on uh, about this program. I encourage people to check out the website, and I want to encourage us all to attend the fiesta. You'll get a real feel of, uh, of just the joyousness and the sense of community um, uh, if you come to the event on May 9th. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to item number seven, which is a public hearing continued from March 26, 2019 on proposed amendments to the general plan general plan, local coastal program, and proposed amendments to the county code chapter 13.10, local coastal program impl implementing to create a permanent room housing, PRH, combining zone district with CEQA notice of exemption as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair Coonerty and Supervisors. The purpose of today's continued public hearing uh, is to consider general plan and county code amendments to create a permanent room housing combining zone district. Um, when we last presented uh, to you at your regular meeting on March 26th, we explained that the vision for the proposed combining zone district is to legally recognize conversion of former visitor accommodation and care facilities uh, to housing in order to ensure that these housing units, which are affordable by design, are preserved and safely maintained. Uh, we presented two components of the policy initiative. First, the general plan uh, land use chapter would need to be amended to enable the creation of the district. And second, the county code would need to be amended to create the district. Um, the board was generally supportive of the proposed amendments but expressed some key concerns uh, regarding the ordinance. Uh, the board expressed that short-term rentals uh, should not be allowed in PRH units, that the ordinance should require, if legally possible, that PRH units be rented to local uh, low or moderate income tenants uh, and uh, emphasize uh, 
retention of existing tenants. Um, uh, the board also directed staff to add findings of denial uh, to the ordinance to provide a clear path to allow decision makers to deny property owners um, with uh, outstanding code violations and other issues. Uh, finally, the board also directed that the inspection checklist be updated to clarify criteria for passing or failing um, and that the ordinance uh, require periodic inspections as well as rental reporting. Okay, so... Um, so regarding the short-term rental use, staff has updated the ordinance uh, so that short-term rentals are not allowed on properties in the PRH district. Uh, regarding residency requirements, um, staff and council have researched this request, um, and it is not legally advised that we require um, that we require retention of existing tenants or require that tenants be based in Santa Cruz because this may violate the Fair Housing Act. Um, we could require that units be deed-restricted affordable housing. Um, staff does not recommend this because it is unlikely that many of the current applicants would um, continue on with the application process if we were to do that and add that restriction. Uh, and we are considering the units to be affordable by design. Um, as an alternative, we have added language to the purpose section of the ordinance to express the intention that the ordinance should serve local uh, low and moderate income tenants. Um, regarding uh, findings of denial, uh, staff has added findings of denial, uh, including uh, active code violation or criminal cases, three, um, three or more uh, code violations in the last two years, untrue statements in the application, failure to meet PRH standards, and uh, <laughs> failure to pay transient occupancy tax uh, for visitor accommodation use. Um, the uh, building inspection form uh, has been updated uh, on the cover page to clarify that every item on the list must be completed or marked as not applicable for every PRH unit in order for the project to pass inspection and, and for the use and development permit to be activated. Um, uh, we have also added um, uh, that uh, reinspection uh, is required every five years to keep the use and development permit active. Um, reporting of rents is now required as part of the application materials as well as the five-year inspection process. Um, there is no rental limit requirement, but the rental information will help uh, the county to understand uh, who is being served by the units and will also help us to be more accurate um, in our income uh, level reporting for these units uh, that we need to do to the Office of uh, Housing and Community Development as part of our regional housing needs assessment. Um, Okay, so um, after the last board hearing, um, staff met with the Coastal Commission um, to present the current version of the ordinance. Um, we have been meeting with the Coastal Commission uh, periodically, um, but at this most recent uh, meeting, the commission did express concern about the compliance with the Coastal Act, uh, specifically the requirement that visitor accommodations, especially low-cost visitor accommodations, uh, are prioritized over residential use in the coastal zone. Um, and that the rezoning triggers a coastal plan amendment. Um, so in response to these comments, staff has made additional changes um, to the proposed general plan amendments and proposed ordinance that I'll explain now. Um, first, the general plan amendments um, have been updated to also modify objective 2.16 and policy 2.16.9, um, as well as making minor text changes to other aspects or other policies that were already being amended. Um, the modification to Objective 2.16 um, emphasizes the importance of preserving uh, low-cost visitor accommodations in the coastal zone, um, which is the key coastal policy. Um, the modification to Policy 2.16.9 um, uh, clarifies that hotels and motels can uh, be converted to residential use, but only if it's demonstrated that the visitor accommodation use is obsolete. Um, Finally, we did remove the 15% affordability uh, requirement that was in this general plan policy um, because that requirement, um, uh, because uh, affordability policies are uh, addressed in the housing element at this time. So that was more of a cleanup item. Um, okay, and then um, staff has also updated the ordinance um, to clarify that properties in the coastal zone that are rezoned into the PRH combining zone district would be subject to local coastal program policies and require coastal approval for rezoning. Um, we have also added to the purposes of the district that it is important to retain low cost visitor accommodations in the coastal zone um, and added a finding that former visitor accommodations in the coastal zone must be found to be obsolete as documented by conditions such as low occupancy rates or a residential use existing for at least three years. 
Um, uh, just to provide an update, um, you may have in your packet as additional materials. Um, yesterday, the county did receive a letter um, from the Coastal Commission that um, states that Coastal Commission staff is um, still not supportive um, with, of allowing the permanent room housing zone district at all uh, in the coastal zone um, because converting visitor accommodations to residential use is in conflict with Coastal uh, Act policies. Uh, staff uh, plans to continue to engage in conversation with coastal staff um, uh, about this project. Our research indicates that there are about 70 potential PRH uh, units in the coastal zone that are existing long-term residential uh, use in former motel buildings. Um, and as drafted, the code would provide a pathway uh, for uh, these property owners to imply, apply for inclusion in the district. Uh, in fact, two of the applications that are already in progress um, with the county are located in the coastal zone. Um, staff uh, believes that they're a more nuanced approach in the coastal zone rather than complete exclusion um, of coastal uh, properties from this district uh, would be appropriate um, it, uh, uh, in order to uh, provide a pathway for preservation of these housing units. Um, uh, the coastal letter uh, states that the central purpose of the PRH combining zone district is to convert existing visitor accommodations to housing. This is actually not true. The central purpose is to preserve existing housing that was already converted from former visitor accommodations and former and former care facilities. Um, in some cases, the zoning on these properties is residential and does not even allow for legal visitor accommodation use at this time. Um, so, uh, and also there are policies in the local coastal program that in fact support preservation of affordable housing in the coastal zone. So this is one area where coastal policies are somewhat in conflict um, with each other. Um, so for these reasons, uh, staff recommends that the board uh, keep the ordinance as drafted um, with staff changes in response to coastal concerns uh, and staff will continue to work with coastal uh, staff uh, as the project moves um, back through the planning commission and comes back to the board. Um, oops. Okay. Um, so uh, staff recommends that the board open a continued public hearing, uh, consider the general plan local coastal program and county code amendments, uh, along with the CEQA notice of exemption, uh, provide direction to staff on the content of the amendments and uh, refer the amendments back to the planning commission for recommendation uh, before bringing this item back to the board. Great. Thank you very much. Questions? Supervisor uh, right. Thank you. Or oh. Supervisor Leopold. Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead, John. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Just had a couple questions uh, around the, <clears throat> the coastal zone uh, properties. <coughs> you gave a number of how many you thought might be in there, but it, it came by quick, so I didn't catch it. Sure, about 70. 70. Uh, units. And, and that includes yeah. the one that, that are already in process. Correct. Okay. Um, and how do we determine what, uh, I mean, how would we, what would be the process for showing that they would be functionally obsolete or economically unfeasible, what, what would we do? Um, right, so, uh, so in the draft ordinance, we do have um, some um, indicators of how we would do that. So one, one way um, would be that the units have been functioning as residential units for more than three years. Um, Another way would be um, through demonstration of low occupancy rates. Um, we, did, we did stop short of requiring specific quantitative requirements um, just because all these properties are so different from each other. It's uh, tough to, to do that. that. That's a place where we may continue to discuss with Coastal what, what we can agree is a good demonstration of obsolescence, but we think that one demonstration is the de facto use of it is as permanent room housing now, properties tend to be used at their highest and best use, and we think that that's a signal that their highest and best use at this time is for permanent residents. And you mentioned that um, there may be some of these properties which aren't even zoned for uh, visitor accommodation. Would you have any sense of that 70 uh, uh, rooms, uh, uh, how many might be um, zoned in a, in a residential mode or some other capacity? Yes, I do. Um, about 30 are zoned uh, residential. <coughs> okay, then so, and so that wouldn't be a subject of which the, uh, the uh, Coastal Commission, you know, they're not losing anything there. Uh, right. Um, that, that's right. Yeah. Well, I'm just, you know, when you, when you look at what the, 
uh, how big how big this issue is. If it's 70 and 30 of them are are, are, are should be uncontestable, uh, then you're down to 40 rooms, and it's a question of how big a fight you want to get into about 40 rooms, right? I mean, everyone's precious, and um, hopefully they uh, can uh, 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 work with the county uh, on that. Uh, a, a very small group of rooms that might be affected, and it might be helpful to notice. You know, I know that in the, uh, uh, the just the Live Oak uh, uh, a special district area for vacation rentals, we have 300 vacation rentals, which are you know many more rooms, um, and so we've worked to actually figure out a way to increase the number of visitor accommodations. Uh, so maybe there's some balance there that, that could be struck. Thank you for your work. Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Ms. Allen, Ms. Levine. I do have some questions, uh, mainly specific to 13.10428C and D. I'll start with D because I think that it actually uh, relates more importantly to C, which deals with uh, the revocation and denial language. So the title actually talks about revocation and denial, but you actually don't enumerate how something can be revoked, you only talk about how something can be denied. So I feel like there should be language that specifies that this also includes, similar to what we did in Canvas, where it actually says deny or revoke. Um, I have some concerns, though. What page are you on? It, on the clean copy of the ordinance, it's page 7. And it's what? what uh, 13.10.428, uh, subsection D. Okay, thank so you. So packet page 38. Okay. So I have some questions, though, about how denial or revocation would actually occur. So let's, uh, assuming that it was the board's interest, and I think it was, that revocation also be possible, not just initial denial. Is it complaint-based? Uh, how is something triggered? That's also not explained uh, within this system of how we would bring something up to the plan or to you or to us. Uh, what triggers it? Um, what happens when somebody sells the property? Are there any, does it automatically, even though we theoretically have a five-year uh, conditional use permit, is this really in perpetuity and you can constantly do it irrespective of who owns it? Um, on a side note, your staff report actually says three or more citations in the last calendar year. The, the, um, the ordinance says in the last two calendar years, so I assume we're going with what the ordinance says and not the staff report, but that should be clear. Uh, to the community. So I have uh, some questions, though, about that. It, it is pretty well known that, that our code compliance tries to cite last, which is to say that a citation is actually a pretty high bar. And in fact, we've received um, a number of complaints over the times I've been in office of things that have warranted a citation that haven't actually received a citation because code compliance works. Uh, well, first off, there's a priority of life and safety. And then by the time they actually get to something down the list, uh, they generally don't cite. So I feel like having three actual citations is actually a high bar. And considering that the language actually says may and not shall revoke or may or shall deny uh, versus deny, then it should just be uh, whether the complaints were filed versus the actual citations were actually issued because I, I, I feel like uh, citations are rare uh, within uh, most of these properties. And, and since it still gives the flexibility on a may versus shall revoke or shall deny, I think that that bar uh, makes more sense. But if you could walk me through some of, of uh, some of these questions, which is how would a complaint, how would something trigger revocation would be useful and whether we need to specify that language within the ordinance then? Um, yeah, we actually were discussing that yesterday. I think that that might be something that needs to be bolstered here in the ordinance and further explained. Um, so the five-year inspection requirement, that would be a staff level requirement. So um, there wouldn't be a necessarily a decision-making process that would happen at the planning commission or the board at that five-year inspection uh, as the ordinance is currently drafted. Um, so the, so and there I is a conflict there. And I, I apologize that I'm not necessarily seeking there to be a higher level of review. What I'm seeking is it enumerated as to what would happen. Mm -hmm. I also think that the inspection in of itself is, is really basic. I mean, for example, what if you had massive neighborhood impacts? What if somebody was starting to violate the code during that five years? Currently, you have a five-year process that's just a health and safety inspection. It has nothing to do, like we do with vacation rentals, if you have a number of complaints, it can be called up for revocation. In this situation, there's no mechanism under your five-year review to do 
that. It just says that at some point within five years, there will be an inspection. Then it even gives an uh, ability to remedy uh, the flaws within that within 90 days. And so to me, that's a pretty high bar for revocation when I think that what well, we're looking for are good actors. If we're gonna give you this ability to actually do the conversion, we wanna know that you're gonna continue to act a certain way. I don't think the language is strong enough and are currently constructed to actually do that. I, I think we'd be willing to hear some direction on that. Also, um, to point out, I, I do think it could be more clear that revocation is also contemplated in this section. There is a separate revocation section of the code in 1810, and um, that has sort of a high bar for starting that process. To um, begin a revocation process, there needs to be a resolution of intention either by the board or the planning commission. So we might want to have some more specific revocation that's just for PRH. Um, regarding the, um, the bar and whether it should be citations or complaints, um, you know, if, if directed, we could look at the vacation rental ordinance as more of a model where that one is based more on complaints. Okay. And what would happen if the property did change hands? Entitlements run with, run with the land. Okay. All right, I think those are all my, my questions for now. Yeah, are there any other questions? Let's hear from the public. Uh, this is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about this item. Reason. Uh, <clears throat> Tim Willoughby speaking for Affordable Housing Now. Uh, we support this. Um, because in addition to trying to create new affordable housing units, uh, we like to maintain existing affordable by design units, and this is a great example of that. And I can speak to this from a personal point of view because in a different place near Mammoth Lakes, I and three other people own four different lodges that are similar to these. Um, and the reality is that the old lodges um, lose their appeal to tourists very quickly, no matter what you do to them. And if you only have eight to 10 units, it costs you too much money to upgrade them to the point where you really are going to attract uh, visitors. And you can't sell it as a lodge because the price of the land has gone up and somebody can't buy it and make it viable with that, few, that small number of units. And the final reason is that lodge owners, it's a 24 seven job and eventually you get tired and you just, you just don't wanna run it as a hotel anymore. So we had the flexibility with our zoning to be able to transition to long-term rentals. And as a result, the, uh, over 30 of the lowest renting units in the Mammoth Lakes area are in those four lodges. So this makes a lot of sense. We really support it. I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Patty Murray, and I am here representing the Toll House Resort. And I've been uh, involved in this project with Daisy since the beginning. And it was uh, presented as an overlying uh, zoning for the property. Um, the Toll House is a unique property. Um, it has various uh, small cabins that are rented to long-term um, housing individuals, families. Um, they are um, lower uh, cost housing by design because they are very small units. And we do have some that are also rented um, in the tourist side of things. So I agree with everything that is on the table. I would like you to um, review the um, not allowing the short-term rental um, on this because that would eliminate this property from being a part of this, um, this project. And uh, we do have two uh, units that do need refurbishing that are currently unavailable for rental at all. And our hands are kind of tied on doing that until we can figure out the proper zoning on that property. So we'd like to be able to provide the low income housing side of things that we've successfully been able to do over 30 some years. But we'd also like to be able to provide the um, uh, short-term rentals as well. And I think that maybe it could be more of an individual property um, analysis of that ability. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Rosemary McNair, and I'm a realtor and a housing advocate, of course. 
Um, and I would like to thank you very much for being creative with this, these solutions that we need to find housing for. Um, I have represented for a very long time, something like almost 30 years, some clients that uh, actually had a motel that was built in 1941 in the Aptos area. And they have been uh, always legally and with the county's cooperation, in fact, in an agreement, they could be kind of the example of how to do it because it's very successful, it's very well managed, and that's a key too, is having a good manager that watches over everything to make sure that it follows all the rules. This is a place that people can afford because by design, they're small. You can't charge a whole arm and a leg when something is as small as some of these motel-sized units. Yet they're comfortable, they're dry, they, they're clean, they have their, um, their ability to kind of serve as their home, and people really are enjoying the fact that it has been become complementary to the neighborhood, even though in a, a long time ago, it was the old-fashioned kind of uh, mo motel sort of situation. So I thank you very much for the opportunity. I think that they have already been inspected many times over the years, um, something like 14 or 15 years. They had pre-inspections all along. So they, they they are your example of how it works. And so I thank you so much for engaging in this process and I certainly hope that it will work. A long time ago it was visitor accommodation but it has been rezoned at the time they made the agreement with the county. So thank you so much, bye bye. Uh, hello, <coughs> Honorable Board of Supervisors and <coughs> members of the public. My name is Michael Cox. I'm an employee of a company called Listener Properties, uh, which is a local real estate uh, investment company, family owned. Uh, Doreen Listener is 92. She regrets that she can't be here today to address you directly. <coughs> um, first of all, I support more time to review this. This is a huge issue and the owners really need time to speak with land use experts and get advice um, on some of these requirements. Um, also, I'd like to invite Supervisor Friend to come down and meet with the, the residents of the former Arabian Motel at 10110 Soquel Drive um, and, and uh, engage with them in terms of how things are going for them. I, I think it's a little bit punitive to say, well, uh, as a consequence of your coming in for a largely administrative procedure, we're going to set you up so that in perpetuity, we're gonna have somebody pass judgment on how you're living and get your rental agreements and uh, intrude on your lives. That, that really is concerning to the residents. These are people, they have lives, um, and I think it's a little discriminatory to assume low income means trouble, so let's keep an eye on these folks. And that's my comment, thank you. This will be our final speaker. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner, um, resident of Aptos. I wanna thank you for considering this carefully and for all the good work that uh, planner Daisy Allen and her um, staff has put into this. I've been coming along on this with the Bayview Hotel owner, Ms. Christina Locke, since it was brought up at first. So I do wanna uh, really point out that Ms. Allen said this and acknowledge that this is to acknowledge the existing uses that we know are there and to support it as an affordable means of housing by design. Um, it supports uh, promoting safe housing uh, by bringing it now into uh, legal use. And it also gives the owner flexibility as uh, one of the uh, I think it was Mr. Willoughby said, sometimes owners just get tired of having to do a bed and breakfast um, with all that that goes on and to be able to um, have a steady income source and provide very needed affordable housing by design is a service not only to the community but to uh, maintaining the structural and um, integrity of the buildings that that are in part of this this plan. I want to take exception that I do not feel having um, a complaint-based 
method of possible revocation is fair to the owners. Uh, we all know that sometimes communities get in little tiffs there become um, instances where people complain just out of vindictiveness, and that does go on. We all know that. So I think that to keep it in uh, code violations is more fair with a more professional attitude. And I want to thank Mr. Cox for saying that um, f uh, low-cost, co low, low, low affordable housing units do not necessarily mean trouble. Thank you. Thank you. That closes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation and action. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, I'd like to address some things that probably is really pinpointed to my district. You know, to move the recommended action, uh, and provide some additional direction that uh, we allow applicants the ability uh, to offer short-term rentals of 30 days or less under the following conditions. Uh, that the short-term rentals were legal and established on the property prior to the application for the zoning district, that the property owners are current on their transit occupancy tax, or TOT, to the county, and the maximum number of units available for short-term rental uh, be limited to 30 percent, uh, as recommended previously by the Planning Commission. Okay, so we got a motion. a motion. Uh, I'll second that. And then uh, further discussion, Supervisor Caput, Supervisor Brent. So I have some uh, additional direction on that. I've got some concerns with the motion that's currently on the floor in that, um, and to Mr. Cox's uh, comments, I think that those points are fair, but I think you're missing the point. This is, a, this is a conversation regarding the landlord activity, not the resident activity, and what we want to do is ensure that those that are actually renting to the most vulnerable populations aren't taking advantage of them. And I think it's reasonable that uh, the county put in regulations for health and safety and, and actions so to ensure that those people are protected, um, which is what we're here to do if we're gonna create this new overlay. My concern is in part, some of this motion actually, in some respects, supersedes some of the actions that are actually already within the proposal regarding uh, TOT, for example. We have language on denial or revocation that goes back three years, not just whether somebody's current on it, whether there's any violation within those three years. Um, so uh, that's a more lenient application that's being proposed by Supervisor McPherson right now, and so I, I wouldn't be uh, supportive of that unless modified. I also would like to see, uh, as was mentioned, I think language that specifies revocation within uh, subsection C. Uh, it just simply needs to say, uh, I pull it back up here, excuse me, subsection D that says the, currently says the Planning Commission or Board of Supervisors may deny an application. I think that language should be changed to may deny or revoke uh, an application or permit uh, for any of the following reasons. These reasons are enumerated. I think that that reason should include uh, complaints and the reason uh, under subsection five and that, the reason I say that is because it's a may and not shall. And so it still allows for a discretionary review as to the merits of whether that is. But we need to acknowledge that the county does not provide a lot of citations for a lot of things. Uh, we have made that a policy to try and do that. And if we're gonna make that as a high bar, I, I just don't think that that's a reasonable bar. Uh, in regards to the revocation, I think it should be more than just health and safety. Uh, what if these units weren't rented for low income anymore? Uh, what if we find that they're being rented at $2,500 a month, for example? I mean, shouldn't that be a, a point of review or a point of consideration if the point of this is to provide for affordable housing? If it moves out of that, I think that that should be uh, something. Also, neighborhood impacts. If there are uh, uh, impacts within the community where people are concerned about the activities that the owners are, are doing, that should be uh, this is similar to what the vacation rental ordinance currently has. So uh, unless some of these are considered friendly amendments and we can have a discussion about what this short-term rental component would mean, I wouldn't be supportive of the current uh, motion that's on the floor, which is unfortunate because I'm actually supportive of the PRH with these modifications, I think, as presented. And so I'd like to have that discussion with Supervisor McPherson about uh, willingness to modify as presented. So... Uh, we'll take that as a. As well, it's, be, it's, a, be, it's, as be, it's a, being proposed as such. Otherwise, I can just in introduce a substitute motion. I'll take the chair's prerogative on that. But uh, so, I understand. You understand, and are you okay with those as a friendly amendment, or? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So they've been adopted and in, in, in as a friendly amendment, which 
you Does, is the clerk clear on what the friendly amendment was? Friendly, okay. I think uh, well, at some point we're, there's gonna have to be a recitation of what the motion is, because uh, it's it may be slightly confusing to this supervisor. Okay, so, uh, so why don't we go back uh, and restate your motion, and then Supervisor Friend, just be super clear on the, the, what specifically you want amended. And okay, then that's we'll fair. That and I understand um, the uh, that the um, the uh, applicants must um, um, shall allow. Well, we should allow the applicants to have the ability to offer short-term rentals for 30 days or less under some criteria that I meant. The three: the short-term rentals were legal and established use on the property prior to the application for the zoning district. The property owners are current on their TOT remittance to the county, and the maximum number of units available for short-term rental should be limited to 30% of the property as recommended previously by the Planning Commission. In addition to the recommended actions right, before correct. us today. Right. So we have the recommended actions in addition to Supervisor McPherson's uh, uh, additions based on vacation, limited vacation rentals. Then you have Supervisor McPherson, or Supervisor Friend's uh, friendly amendments, which uh, have to do with revocation. And clarification of the language around uh, TOT. And clarification of the language around TOT. So the ordinance as proposed currently has TOT language that I'm, I'm saying should remain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And not, uh, and the revocation language would uh, direct staff to have uh, on uh, subsection D number five, as opposed to three or more citations, would be three or more complaints for violation of the county code. It would, um, um, and now I'm losing my own train of thought here, and, and provide additional information on revocation specific under subsection D. The Board of Supervisors may deny or revoke an application or permit. And then under uh, C, which deals with uh, the five-year inspection, just that it that the inspection would consider other elements just beyond this health and safety, such as neighborhood impacts, that they're still remaining affordable by design, other factors of consideration in, in that, that would be part of the report. Okay, so that is the motion before us. Supervisor Leopold. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I can agree with most of these things, but uh, I think we have to just determine whether this is about housing or about short-term rentals, and it's, it's one or the other, and, and uh, the, I think of, of, of uh, trying to split this m makes it much harder. We should either say this is about preserving a, a housing stock for, uh, uh, for affordable by design uh, uh, housing, or it should be short-term rentals. But to have this the, um, bifurcation, um, I, I don't think works for me. I think we, we should choose what it is, what our policy goal is here. My policy goal is to uh, to provide uh, uh, more housing. Okay, let me just say I supported the motion because I heard that one of the properties in which we're trying to f reg formalize current housing is saying they won't participate. We, have, we did a lot of work for a relatively few number of properties um, and to lose uh, several, I think, one, it undermines the, the work we've done to, to formalize this process and to recognize that each property is going to be different and let's allow some leeway so that we can try to keep more properties in this program. So I, I share the goal. I just don't want to lose what is uh, where, where we could have, and I don't know if there's additional potential units where, we, where we, they would stop and not participate, but I think uh, we want to have as broad a tent as possible to allow participation assuming that they're good characters and um, good members of our community providing a resource. So it's yeah, a, it's no, a I, I, I understand that, I mean, it seems like almost every one of these properties is a unique situation, right? Yeah. Uh, and if we have 30 units, if we have 70 units that are in the coastal zone, there, uh, I guarantee you that's gonna be um, an individual uh, piece that's gonna have to uh, be worked out uh, I just think it's easier to have a, a standard and set to it rather than try to um, uh, 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 try to have this be figured out at, at all the time 
uh, for each individual property. I think that's going to be difficult, and I think that's why we should get clear. Chair, would it be amenable to you that we split this question and cast two different votes? I think there's agreement on the recommended actions, which are very simple. I think there's agreement on my modifications to the current ordinance. I think that seems universal, where there's disagreement on whether we should allow the short-term conversions. If we took those as two separate motions, it would allow uh, the board to speak to those two specific things, where there could be, I think, unanimity on most of this and then just a debate on whether we go short-term. Sure, so why don't we split the actions? Uh, uh, and so f the first vote, Moving it back to, uh, to voting now, uh, the first vote will be the recommended actions with your additional language around revocation. Um, uh, and I assume that's, that's just that amendment uh, for the purposes of I think of that's stuff. understood. Okay. No, Ryan did. I can vote, Ryan. Yes on that, and I could vote on the other motion as well then too. Yeah. Yeah, you, you'll have a chance to vote yes on both or? or yeah. So, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. The second part, the second vote will be on Supervisor McPherson's uh, motion to allow limited vacation rentals uh, um, under the conditions you set forth. Correct. And then I assume your, your amendment around the TOT. Well, I think that since we just adopted the original language Which of the TOT, I mean, it, it, okay. it is what it is. But okay. I mean, I. You know, I respect what he's trying to do, and I respect the work that's being done by the toll house. I'm not just, I'm just not supportive of this as a, as a policy writ large. So I'll be voting against the short-term rental uh, component. Understand. Sure. So, uh, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. So that passes three to two. Great. And thank you, uh, thank you, the staff, for your work, and thank you to everyone who came out to testify today. Um, we do have a 10.45 scheduled item. Um, however, we're going to take a 10-minute break and come back at 5 after uh, to, to start that item. And thank everyone for, for waiting yeah, today. A good, good way to do it. Great. Great.
So uh, let's, uh, let's call the session back to order and we'll move to our 1045 scheduled item, which is item number 14, to consider a report on the Cannabis Licensing Officer operations and providing additional direction to the Cannabis Licensing Office regarding potential changes to the Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 7.128 and 13.10 that could increase the number of licenses in the program and reduce the time it takes to achieve licensure as outlined in the memorandum of the County Administrative Officer. Mr. LaForte. Uh, this quarterly report is a summary of the Cannabis Licensing Office activities and licensing operations. Um, over the past 10 months, we've determined that it's taking considerably longer to bring cultivation operations through to licensure than was originally anticipated. Significant, um, significantly less registrants than initially anticipated are following through with the licensing application process, and this combination could ultimately jeopardize the overall success of the program. To begin, staff will be presenting a review of first quarter activities, which are summarized on exhibits A and B. Um, with regard to compliance activity, the department is divided into two overlapping spheres, the two CLO code compliance investigators and the two deputy sheriffs who are supervised by a chief deputy on temporary assignment to the CLO. The CLO code compliance staff concentrates primarily on um, compliance of operating cannabis businesses with local letters of authorizations or in the pre-application process and respond to complaints, while the deputy sheriffs primarily investigate illegal cannabis activities, taking a proactive approach in investigating leads generated from a variety of sources. Um, CLO code compliance staff have begun a comprehensive quarterly compliance inspection and education program for all cannabis operators, and staff have completed 28 inspections on the 43 operational sites, which have resulted in 145 corrective actions, zero citations, and zero NOVs. The issuance of corrective actions is twofold, to ensure compliance with all applicable regulations, and they're utilized to educate our operators on the extensive regulatory system they must comply with. The goal of the compliance inspection program is to have the best operators in the state. And we've received positive feedback from multiple operators who are happy to have a third party reviewing their compliance system before the state inspects. While the deputy sheriff's approach to the illegal market has resulted in 16 search warrants served, they've seized 1,295 pounds of processed cannabis, over 10 pounds of cannabis extract, and the sheriff's office data compares the last quarter of 2018 to the first quarter of 2019, the details of which show the change in approach they've made to a focus on the illicit market. Uh, moving on to analysis of chapter 7.128, staff would like to begin by stating the analysis presented does not include any of the most sensitive zones, such as the residential agricultural zone, special use zone, and timber production zone. A very limited analysis of la large agricultural parcels will be presented, and this analysis does not include anything with regard to setbacks of any commercial cannabis activity. Um, moving forward, as we've progressed the licensing process and as the state has moved has continued to refine its rules and regulations, a variety of issues have presented themselves. Some concern potential conflicts between state and local law, while others relate to whether the current ordinance may be restricting marketplace activities in a way the board would wish to address. If your board wants to tackle any of these issues, it would be best to do so before July 1st, 2019, when the state CEQA exemption for cannabis ordinances expires. In addition, to the extent any changes to Chapter 1310 would be contemplated, the Planning Commission would need to, a chance to review them and your board, uh, and provide your board with a recommendation. Uh, the first area of analysis is the cannabis cultivation definition and um, nursery licenses. The cultivation definition in county code covers all aspects of cultivation, while the state definition differentiates between immature and mature plant growth based on the flowering of the cannabis plants. Additionally, state allows cultivators to possess a nursery license, which includes all activities associated with cannabis cultivation um, other than flowering. The definition of immature plant, specifically the portion which states which is not flowering, has been a point of contention for the board previously because it can be viewed in contrast to our current commercial agricultural nurseries. Our office doesn't see this as a challenge to ensure our operators are abiding by the state definition due to the length of time it takes a cannabis plant to reach maturity paired with the state's implementation of the track and trace program. A good way to think of a commercial cannabis nursery versus a typical agricultural nursery is as a small plant farm, um, as staff has, has dubbed them. Uh, nursery inclusion would be most applicable to the commercial agricultural zone district as nursery operations typically occur within greenhouse and differentiation of this license type could include different operational requirements because immature plants are not odorous, the tracking of the plants is not as labor intensive, and this appears to be a viable business model for some of our existing commercial nurseries. 
Um, moving on to. Do you have recommendations then about this? Um, the staff does have recommendations prepared for the nursery license type, and staff feels a nursery license type could be included in all zone districts, but a site which, which wishes to pursue a nursery license should go under the same level of use permit review in all zone districts, except potentially the CA district. Due to the lack of odor associated with immature plants and the desire expressed by um, current agricultural operators, staff feels it would be appropriate that a use permit review level of three for all nursery operations in the CA zone um, could be permissible. If a nursery operation needed an exception, staff feels it would be appropriate to increase the level of a review to a four so that notification is provided to the public. Um, additionally, square footage of nursery operations would need to be limited within code. Staff feels the best method to do this is to defer to the current canopy limits set in 7.128 for applicants um, just seeking a nursery license. For applicants seeking a nursery and a cultivation license, um, staff feels it would be appropriate to increase the overall land dedicated to commercial cannabis activity by 50% in the CA zone only. Um, the additional 50% increase of space would be limited to nursery operations only. An example of this uh, would be a single licensee in the CA zone on a parcel greater than 20 acres is currently allowed 22,000 square feet, but would be allowed 33,000 square feet of cultivation space um, or 11,000 square feet of additional immature plant growth area, right? This change in the CA zone reflects an, an actual increase of 1.25% of the applicable land to cannabis in the CA zone. Um, or an increase from 2.5% to 3.75%. Um, in regards to the cultivation definition, it would be necessary to adjust the definition in order to have a nursery license type also. That's helpful, thank you. Um, moving forward, in, with regard to analysis of the canopy definition, the current definition includes all designated areas that will contain cannabis plants at any point in the plant life cycle. This differs from the state definition, which includes all areas that will contain mature cannabis plants, similar to the topic we just covered. This, def this difference in definition paired with the defined canopy size has created a competitive disadvantage for our cultivators in our jurisdiction. Um, for example, local operators are paying for a specific square footage of canopy at a state level, but potentially cultivating less cannabis per square foot under the local definition because the local square <coughs> footage includes the immature plant areas. Reconciling the state and local definitions will provide a more level playing field um, for operators in our jurisdictional area. And uh, it'd just be helpful if there's recommendations um, in, in these categories, it'd just be helpful to get them as staff, we go along. Staff has prepared recommendations and we'll present them moving forward. Okay. Um, an alignment of the definition would result in two possible paths forward. The simplest path would be to allow all immature plant growth areas under the currently defined canopy limits. The second option, um, which is the option that staff would recommend, is the same as the first, but allow for unlimited immature plant growth areas in true indoor cultivation sites within the C4 and M zones. This will be self-limiting due to the economics and the limited C4 and M zone properties. This option would allow indoor operators in the C4 and M zones the ability to complete all immature plant growth areas they need to provide plants for their flowering operations without limiting their canopy or their overall production. Uh, this inclusion would not allow C4 and M operators an ability to sell plants per the state's nursery license definition. Um, the most complex option would be to define immature plant growth areas in all zones, potentially not the CA zone, if a nursery license is acceptable to the board. Staff feels the second option, um, paired with a nursery license in the CA zone, would be the most appropriate path forward. Um, Moving on to analysis of the eligibility restrictions. Um, the current program is limited to operators who originally registered in 2016 with the exception of existing commercial agricultural operators. Initially, there were 760 registrants and as the program has progressed and the registrants have dropped out or failed to follow through with requested information, there are now 438 registrants, 63 um, cultivation registrants who were able to obtain local let letters of authorization and state licenses. Staff has obtained data via the compliance checks, enforcement activities, and the industry which indicate the eligibility restrictions appear to have driven potential licensees out of our jurisdictional area or into the illicit market. Um, a second eligibility restriction includes the requirement that a cultivator or cultivation manager reside in a permitted structure on the parcel except for sites in the CA, C4, and M zones. This restriction has led to the exclusion of 
potential sites within the A zone, including on parcels larger than 30 acres. Staff analyzed parcel data and determined there are several parcels zoned A, which could accommodate cannabis cultivation should there be a change to the residence requirements. Staff also prepared the following map, um, the map shown currently, and there are 58 parcels over 30 acres, 28 over 40 acres, 16 over 50, and nine over 60. Um, Staff believes a change in the eligibility restrictions with regard to requiring people to be a registrant is warranted due to the low number of use permits that have, act, that have currently been applied for. Based on brand value associated with cannabis grown in Santa Cruz, the potential for non-registrants to open businesses while providing additional co-location space for locals, the numerous local cultivators who are operating outside of our jurisdictional area, the increased commute miles associated with those business, staff see the potential to reduce eligibility requirements. Any potential change would not result in immediate impacts as anyone wishing to cultivate in our jurisdictional areas will be required to go through the pre-application process, obtain a use permit, and fulfill the conditions of approval before being eligible for a cannabis business. Um, no commercial cannabis could activity until it could begin until a commercial um, business license is issued. Now with regard to the A zone, staff would like direction from the board if they would like large parcels in the A zone to be viewed differently. If so, staff believes large A zone parcels should be should have similar canopy limits to the CA zone, as these sites will have to meet all security requirements the CLO and Sheriff's Department have developed, including securing the site, limiting access, and video recordings of the site egress points available um, to be viewed from anywhere, so sites will likely require power and internet um, access, upgrades associated with those. Uh, moving on to the differentiation of canopy limits, Canopy limits within code are not explicitly differentiated between indoor and outdoor cultivation operations. And true in, indoor operations, not greenhouses, offer the high, a high level of security as well as economic benefits associated with redevelopment of existing infrastructure. Our office has received inquiries from potential licensees who wish to pursue indoor cultivation operations within existing structures in the CA zone. Um, However, with canopy limits restricted to 22,000 square feet for a single operator, pursuing indoor cultivation is not commercially feasible for many operators in the CA zone. For reference, 7.128 does not base canopy limits on parcel size for the class C4 and M licenses, which are preliminarily indoor operations. During the drafting of the current chapter, CA zone parcels were intended to offer additional cultivation locations for operators who existed on parcels that would no longer be eligible once the ordinance was passed. However, the current discrepancy of canopy limits based on parcel size in the CA zone versus the C4 and M zone is pushing more operators to consider relocating to indoor commercially zoned spaces, thus decreasing the availability of such spaces to other types of industries. Differentiation of canopy limits based on indoor versus outdoor cultivation in the CA zone could potentially free up indoor industrial spaces while providing additional avenues for relocation and economic benefits associated with the redevelopment of existing commercial agricultural buildings and infrastructure. Canopy limits in the, CA, in the C4 and M zones are up to the discretion of the licensing official and the same approach could be taken for indoor cultivation in the CA zone. Balancing such an expansion with the need to prevent any additional losses of viable agricultural soil associated with the redevelopment is of critical importance. And through discussions with the planning department, staff feel this can be mitigated through use permit conditions. Um, in regards to a recommendation, to make the differentiation align with the county strategic plan goals and the value of agricultural soil, staff believes allowing a different canopy size for indoor operations in the CA zone must be restricted to lands which are already developed and impacts to soil such as impervious surfaces have already been made. Examples being areas which are current currently have a concrete foundation or are paved or have buildings on top of them. The total redevelopment footprint footprint, including parking, water tanks, et cetera, must be limited to those currently developed areas, and restrictions must also be placed on the parcel to avoid additional ancillary takes of land, which are currently permissible for other commercial agricultural operations. Um, an example of this is if a farmer has a barn that they store their equipment in, they decide to lease that barn out. That barn is redeveloped for commercial cannabis activities. The um, the farmer who owns the land would be restricted and not be allowed to have an additional ancillary take of land to develop a new barn to house his equipment. Um, that's, that's the recommendation that staff has come up with with the planning department to ensure that no additional takes of land in the CA zone occur associated with this redevelopment. Uh, Mr. Laforte, if you could just slow down a little bit. There's a, there's a lot to digest here. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> if the Board of Supervisors has any questions on any one of these, I'd be happy to, to address them as we move through this. Okay. 
Um, uh, processor licensing option is uh, the, the next round of analysis, and the state differentiates this activity and has a license mechanism for independent processing. Now, processing is the act of trimming, drying, curing, grading, and pack packaging and labeling of cannabis. Currently, the county does not have this license mechanism, and um, all of our outdoor operators which are seeking use permits are not proposing to do any uh, processing on site because of fire uh, requirements to have sprinklers in any facility that has cannabis um, stored within it. Now, uh, the driver behind, oh, now this gap in available license type has led to cannabis being transported out of our jurisdictional area creating inefficiency in the local market, increasing vehicle miles traveled throughout the county, and reducing the overall tax revenue from our local industry. Um, in terms of recommendations, staff recommends incorporating a processor license type applicable only to existing buildings in the CA, C4, and M zones, and any efficiency improvements to the local marketplace are beneficial as they reduce the vehicle miles traveled, improve economic comp um, competitivity of cannabis cultivated here and provide economic benefits associated with jobs and tax revenue for the county. Moving on to the next item uh, is advertising restrictions. Previously the board um, changed the advertising restrictions under 7.130 for retail cannabis operations and uh, staff wanted to bring this to your attention uh, because currently our non-retail <coughs> cannabis operators are operating on a statewide market and they'd like to be able to advertise similar to our retailers, um, which is in line with the state restrictions. Um, and we'd like to maintain the prohibition on all aspects of um, advertising cannabis businesses and cannabis products <coughs> from being portrayed on signs visible to the public in line with the changes that were recently made to 7.130. Um, Lastly, with regard to the use permit review process, um, cannabis projects, they're subject to commercial, their commercial developments and they must undergo uh, the use permit and CEQA determination. This process is the most time consuming portion of the licensing process. The use permit process for cannabis is different than other commercial use permits due to the agricultural nature of cultivation and the best management and operational practices requirements. Non-cannabis commercial agricultural operators are concerned about the cost and time associated with commercial cannabis use permits and licensure. As experienced growers, they see cannabis operations as preliminary sw preliminarily swapping out one commercial crop for another. While this may be an oversimplification, the level five use permit review process uh, seems particularly burdensome for some cultivation operations. Reducing summer operations to a lower level of review would not reduce the extent of review or the need for CEQA determinations, but could greatly reduce the time for projects to complete the licensing process and begin operations. In many situations, the amount of time saved could be a minimum of three months, and this extended process is a barrier to the county from obtaining cannabis tax revenue. Additionally, staff does not believe it was the board's intention to create barriers to entry for our existing commercial agricultural operators. Staff's recommendation on this topic is to reduce the use permit level to three for all, applica all applicants in the CA, C4, and M zones. And this change should be limited to applicants who are not seeking an exception to setbacks within the three zones. Changing the use permit level to three will not reduce the detail <coughs> of the review, but will streamline the process by reducing the need for notification and public hearing. Staff recommends this limited change as the implementation of the use permit process under chapter 1310 has resulted in practically all use permits requiring a level five review. Examples of this include any cultivation site in the CA zone, which utilizes greater than 20,000 square feet of an existing greenhouse, um, any cultivation in the M zone, cultivating more than 10,000 square feet or 5,000 square feet in the C4 zone, and any new development greater than 2,000 square feet in the CA zone. Um, if this recommendation can be pursued, paired with pursuing recommendations to allow for a nursery license type in the CA zone, the board would eliminate some of the barriers to entry for our existing commercial agricultural operators. Um, lastly, if your board is interested in addressing this or any of the issues outlined above, staff could return at your May 14th meeting with recommendations. Um, this would allow sufficient time to take any contemplated changes to chapter 1310 to the planning commission and then return to your board on June 11th for a first reading of an ordinance to modify the program and beat the clock for the um, state CEQA deadline of July 1st, 2019.
Okay, great. Um, so thank you for that, uh, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, I know that was a lot. Sorry. So let me, let me try to frame this up because um, these are a lot of issues and it, they're complex issues. And so, so as we don't get lost, I think what I'd like to do is have board members ask, we're gonna take each issue one at a time and board, board members who wanna ask questions can ask those questions. Uh, and we'll sort of get a sense of where the board is, then we'll have public comment, and then I'll entertain motion or if people want to divide up the question uh, on some of these to give you recommendations. I will say, just in general, I think it would have been better to come forward with a set series of recommendations, especially because a number of these things, the nurseries and the canopy, were recommendations, many of us wanted this uh, different definitions in the first place, and staff had recommendations that we go in the other direction, and now we're reversing course, which is okay because we're learning as we go, but it would have been helpful to have the staff, since they drove this process in the first place, to get us these definitions, to have staff say, well, these definitions aren't working for X, Y, and Z reasons, and here's the recommended action. So I, it, in the future, I think just bringing us a series of recommended uh, recommendations would be much more helpful. So let me start by asking if any board members have questions about the nursery uh, changes. You bet. Supervisor Kaplan. Okay. Uh, basically, from what I've read on this, uh, <coughs> we're trying to get more uh, cultivators, I guess, to actually comply and get their license fees. Is that correct? Okay. It, it is to provide more cultivators legal ac or market access to the legal market so yes in a sense sure and also to speed up the process yes okay what i what i couldn't find was is any of this uh, is some incentive is it uh, lowering license fees no uh, how about taxing any taxing whatsoever involved in this staff is not per, um there would be taxation on um nursery operations under the current code. Um, any operations not defined under current code are, are taxed. So, so we could incorporate that later. Sure. Supervisor Caput, we're gonna work through each one of the issues that he talked about today in order. So the first one was, do people have questions about the proposed or the, uh, about changes to the nursery definition? So do you have questions about the nursery? Yeah, well, I, anyway, I, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is the incentive uh, that what, the incentive is speeding up the process and what and what else? We're allowing more to, we're being more generous in the number of people we're allowing in. We're, we would actually be providing a license type that is allowed under state definition. Um, and the regulatory burden associated with that license type is decreased versus a mature commercial cannabis um, cultivation site. And the basis for this really was inquiries from existing commercial nurseries within the CA zone ha would like to pursue a cannabis nursery option. Um, they feel like it's viable for their business, but they see the current process as being overly burdensome because they don't want to be defined as a cannabis cultivator. They want to be a cannabis nursery. They want to apply as a state nursery license. And they see the opportunity to cultivate cannabis as a nursery only. Um, and they feel it's, it needs to be separate and defined. And it would affect the use permit process because various portions of the best management and operational practices plan would not be applicable to them due to the no odor um, from immature plant growth. So okay. it, it affects our, it mainly affects our existing commercial agricultural nurseries and staff's proposal is really geared towards the CA zone. Okay, and well, the question of the, what I'm getting at is that we're reacting to uh, some of them not wanting to what comply, and if and if they don't comply, they're going to do it on their own. No, um, we're we're providing the recommendation is to provide a license type that's viable for our commercial agricultural <coughs> operators um, in greenhouses that has a lower level of regulatory burden at the state level. 
Uh, Supervisor Caput, you we're trying to uh, we're trying to make it uh, more in line with the state recommendation. Or, yes, al alignment with the state with a preference to the CA zone. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I just want to clear up one thing in my mind that uh, I read in there uh, law, you know, de uh, sheriffs uh, are involved, public uh, public safety, uh, the environment was mentioned in it. And to me, when, when I read that, it's if, if we don't make this easier, then there is a group, a subgroup, is it large or small, that's not going to comply and they're going to go ahead and do it on their own anyway. Yes, I believe that is an appropriate assumption. That's what we've seen through our enforcement activities that previously registered people have um, gone to the illicit market because yeah. the barriers to entry they believe are too high. And I, th I think we've been uh, liberal on this uh, with people, and I, I, the concern I have is, is the dog wagging the tail or is the tail, tail wagging the dog? And that's, that's my concern. I, uh, when somebody won't comply, uh, how, how far are we going to go in order to get them to comply? I, I don't think the inclusion of a nursery license type in any way um, yeah. uh, will bring in people who are sure. willing to go to the illicit market. Okay, I think and, that and one thing on the environment, I'm big on that. I, I want to get, you know, I want to get people to comply uh, in order to save the environment. But I want to make it clear, <clears throat> basically, I think I'm correct on this, a room about this size uh, cultivating uh, uh, and growing marijuana, uh, the electric and heating bill is about $25,000 a month. Um, I, I don't believe that the nursery license type, I don't, I don't believe that's applicable to a nursery license type because the economics behind nursery license type point to uh, greenhouses using natural light and shade cloth. So nursery license types um, specifically they generally don't pencil out financially as an indoor operation. And that's why the staff's recommendation is, is really geared to our existing commercial nurseries, allowing them a path forward um, to be a cannabis nursery. Yeah, well, when it comes to the environment, if somebody's burning up $25,000 a month in electrical or uh, heating, and then we're asking everybody in their own households to cut back and you know save the environment and uh, not use so much energy. Uh, we're at this point uh, almost saying, okay, go ahead. Uh, go ahead and burn up as much energy as you want. I'd like to see restrictions in the future well, on, on that. Okay, um, yeah. in order to keep this um, clear for folks, right now we're talking about nurseries. Nurseries are only done in a greenhouse environment. Greenhouse, yeah. um, so they don't have that energy cost. Do you have any questions about the nursery changes that were, that were talked about? Okay, and a lot of it. I'm just trying to make sure we're consistent and uh, we don't say one thing and at the same time we're saying another. Okay. So, uh, Supervisor Pearson, do you have any questions about yeah, the nursery just, um, component? Um, you know, we we've, we really pressed for local control, and now we're kind of shifting our gears here. But uh, I, I think this would come under the nursery uh, for the canopy zones. Um, how much difference does that make? We're going to follow state standards rather than our own. I mean, no, no, no. We we would defer. <laughs> no change in overall footprint of commercial cannabis activity on any one parcel. Um, the staff recommendation to allow an additional 50% for the CA zone for nurseries is the only change that would affect the actual size of space dedicated to commercial cannabis activity in any zone district. How much different, I mean, generally, how many, an acreage, how much difference could that make, I guess? Uh, um, well, for a single operator in the CA zone, their parcel size would need to be a minimum of 20.2 acres to have a 22,000 square foot license. And under that license, we would add an additional 11,000 square feet of space dedicated to commercial cannabis activity, specifically for nursery operations. Which is less than 5% of the entire parcel. Yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah, an right. addition of 1.25% right. of the entire parcel. The whole, the whole parcel, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, I like the movement to get a more predictable timetable uh, and just more predict, predictability uh, overall. Uh, but right now, that's, that's all the main things I had. Okay. Um, 
Is that all you have about yes. all the different changes? Well, I don't know. I can't remember them all. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So let's uh, um, short-term memory loss. Yeah. Uh, right, yeah. So uh, uh, let's. Um, so I'm going to assume uh, that instead of going topic by topic, we're going to go supervisor by supervisor, and I ask the supervisors to all work through the different proposals so that we can try to um, see where we are. So any questions about any of seven proposals? Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for your efforts to manage this meeting. Um, uh, well, first I just want to say is that uh, our effort at regulation um, was born out of not having a statewide regulatory system. And so our efforts to create something was uh, honest and uh, straightforward and involved a lot of community conversation. And now uh, a year plus into the to um, the regulatory system uh, proposed by the state gives us an opportunity to t sort of take a look at uh, did we did we turn the screws a little too hard or not enough and and to try to make this better and so on the nursery definition you know Kurt Schmidt uh, had come to us originally and at the time our staff thought that w there wasn't many people who were going to take advantage of it but the practice you're saying um, um, is that people like this option Yes, we've had inquiries from um, 10 of our existing commercial agricultural operators who would prefer to just go down the nursery pathway. Seven of those um, operations have submitted pre-applications um, and have said they will be pursuing a use permit for nursery operations only. Um, the other three are still step, have stepped back because they want to make sure that they can be a nursery only. And I just want to be clear, when you say traditional agriculture operators, th those are the, the long-term farmers that yes. have been here, and what we were trying to do is make sure that people from this area can actually uh, take advantage of it. And at least I understand uh, the nursery piece is doesn't have the flowering piece, so it doesn't have the smell, um, and doesn't have the same kind of impacts that, uh, that uh, a more mature flower would have, right? Yes, that's correct. And what other agricultural processes go through the level three uh, permitting process now? Would um, you know? That would be changes of existing agricultural crops. I, I would actually rather defer to planning, but um, under 20,000 square feet of changes. In Noticeably existing, absent in this room, no. <laughs> in existing, uh, oh, planning staff is here oh, actually okay. to All address right. questions associated with the CA zone. But um, changes to greenhouse space, uh, less than 20,000 square feet would, would remain in there. And this is essentially a, a change of crop, um, especially for a nursery operation where there is no odors. Now, th the sites would have to maintain compliance with all of the Cannabis Licensing Office and Sheriff's Department's security requirements. So we would maintain public safety through um, the security pl plan requirements. Yeah, well, I, I support uh, this change. The, the uh, question about canopy definition, it, it was hard in your, in your Federal Express uh, yes. uh, presentation <laughs> to, uh, uh, to, to totally grok uh, what we were tr uh, trying to do about the canopy definition. I understood that we we're looking at it, something in the C4 and M zoned areas. So, so the, difference, the difference is um, we could define immature plants and mature plants, defining canopy as mature plants only, and then we could restrict the overall footprint of commercial cannabis cultivation to the existing um, approved footprints for canopy per the code. And staff's recommendation would be to allow um, immature plant growth in any of the zone districts but not allow that to equal an expansion of the overall footprint of the operations. The, the C4 and M zones, we feel it would be appropriate to have unlimited immature plant growth because it would be self-limiting because those operations would be restricted to indoor operations. As such, you know, we're not, county is not a cannabis cultivator. We can't say, oh, well, you only need 25% for nursery or 50%, it'd be best for the industry to self-regulate what they need image in terms of immature plant growth. And it is financially self-limiting um, for them to have, they'll want to have a steady crop going and they could maximize their potential harvest per year by having unlimited immature plant growth and it would sink them with the state definitions also. 
That seems to also make sense uh, to me. And I think it's just sort of our own uh, awareness of these immature plants and what role that they play. Uh, we knew something about that before, but it seems like now, as this industry has more solidified, uh, that we are becoming better aware. The cultivators probably were very aware for a long time, but, uh, but uh, as we as uh, policymakers might be becoming better aware. Um, the the uh, question about uh, eligibility, uh, there's, it seems to me there's two parts to that. Yes. Uh, one, which is um, opening it up to people who weren't in our registration program. Uh, that seems pretty straightforward. Um, uh, I think the, the concern, uh, if you can address, is uh, these people have been waiting for a long time. The, you said there's something like 400 and some odd yep. who were still in the system. Um, let's say now I want to get into the, to the cannabis business. Am I jumping in front of them, or how will that work? Um, a preference could be put in place for original registrants. Um, the recommendation from staff is to allow outside operators or operators from our area who are just you know, actually seeking commercial cannabis operations and have them developed in other areas to be closer to home. Right. Um, the idea behind it is that those operators, through the benefits of co-location in their use permit, would actually um, provide for additional spaces for our original registrants that aren't being provided for. And the driver behind this recommendation is the fact that only seven people are currently pers have submitted use permits under review. Um, we have a lot of people who are cleared 41 people, to be exact, who are cleared to submit use permits at the, this time, but um, as stated, only seven have. So, so we have 400 plus registrants. We have 40 plus uh, who have been cleared through pre-application, yes. but only seven who are currently in the, the, that final process. Yes. Um, and so this would open it up to others. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's a stampede with our existing registrants. No, it, it does not appear um, there is the initial concerns associated with the high number of registrants that you know initially totaled over 760, I believe. Um, so the flow is not what I believe um, the board initially perceived it would be. Yeah. On the question of A-zone land and the 30-plus acres, this, uh, there could be merit in this. Uh, this map doesn't provide enough information, <coughs> at least for me, okay. uh, to know about it. And I think, uh, uh, I think that we'd all probably want to take a little bit closer look at what that actually means in our district. Yep. At least I know I would. Uh, I won't speak for the rest of them. But, the, but uh, there, there may be merit to this, you know, for only allowing a couple percentage uh, of, uh, of the land. Um, um, you have to bring services to it is w where they are and what um, it, it might make sense. I, I don't. I don't uh, St I'm staff, staff understands that the A zone is um, a sensitive area, and that's why our analysis only included these larger parcels, and staff's not providing any recommendations on this because we feel like it should have been. It should be brought to the board's attention, and the board should contemplate whether um, larger A zone parcels could be viewed differently than the smaller parcels, which um, are more sensitive in nature, generally because they're open space and they're closer to the special use in residential ag. Yeah, I'd so. be interested in getting more information about that. I'm, okay, I'm not ready to provide any uh, recommendations. The the, the uh, question about uh, I think we called it canopy limits. Um, Canopy limits in the yeah. in the indoor for CA and that differentiation. Yeah, the the about um, um, that already the impacted soils and and using structures that may already be there or remodeling. Yes, um, but not disturbing any additional land and not providing um, uh, and placing some restrictions on whether something else could be built to replace that. Um, that also seems uh, to make, uh, and I think it goes along with um, with what some of our efforts have been through planning, which is how do we get old structures to be rehabilitated, um, and sometimes trying to find a way to to, to make that happen uh, through regulatory uh, uh, changes or changes of use. It, it's something that that we've looked at in a number of different ways uh, for housing and commercial spaces. So that seems to me to make. Uh, um, to make sense, and by placing those limits, it doesn't it doesn't open a a, a big flood door. 
Uh, the processing uh, license option seems like we should have a processing license option. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward. The advertising piece also seems fairly straightforward. Um, and uh, changing the use permit review also seems to m make a lot of sense to me. Uh, I think that um, A, given the, the, the number of uh, applications that are coming through, um, uh, there will be plenty of eyes on these uh, still. Um, and I can't think of any other industry where we're, tr we're trying to make it harder for someone to get a permit. Um, and I think that our policy goal should be to, to create an environment where someone could be legal and be in the system and playing by the rules and not creating an, enough hurdles that someone can't be in the system um, and then causes them to think about other choices uh, which don't help any, any of us out. So I would support that. Supervisor Friend. Thank you. I do, I do have a number of questions. I actually think what's being proposed uh, will have significant impacts, environmental and otherwise. Um, disproportionately, actually, in my district and Supervisor Caput's district, um, and while I, I do agree with the fact that the board is, has asked for updates and revisions, I think that the way this is being presented is actually a pretty major change to sort of coming as an update. And so I, uh, the process of that I'm not fully on board with. But I'll, I'll, I'll ask some questions maybe you could help me out with since, yes. you know, we've all only had a couple of days to digest it. But on the canopy definition, um, could you speak to how it would affect the overall square footage limits that have been previously set by the board? Recognizing, by the way, we had multi-year discussions on a number of these items, and a lot of these, I thought, were settled. Um, and so some of these are just sort of coming up as not as settled. Um, so how would uh, it affect the overall square footage limits that the board has previously set? Uh, it would, uh, would not affect the overall square footage limits. Um, the limits are for the C4 and M zones, where the staff is required to um, provide the board updates when we, re we reach 100,000 square feet. And we feel that this recommendation would actually alleviate some of the stress on the C4 and M zone, um, because currently what we're seeing, what we're being told from, from industry and, and in discussions is when C4 and M zone parcels are coming up, um, commercial cannabis companies are trying to obtain those leases very rapidly. And it's, push, it's putting pressure on those zones for other industries. And we don't believe it was the board's intention to push industries out of the C4 and M zone. So opening up the CA for indoor structures and doing the um, revitalization or, or re rebuilding um, should hopefully alleviate some of the pressure on the C4 and M zone, which staff believes was part of the board's initial intention in, in pursuing the limit of 100,000 square feet, for instance. OK, I think that's a. I, I, I don't read it the same way as of what the board's intention was specifically in regards to the C4 and M zone. I do agree that there had been pretty extensive discussions about that currently disturbed commercial activities within the CA zone was an ideal location. We had underused greenhouse space within uh, those facilities, but it was never vis-a-vis -vis other locations throughout the county uh, specific to C4 and M. But um, I think that that's uh, reading into discussions I don't recollect over the last four years specifically. but in, Moving to the eligibility restrictions, um, do you have any idea how many new applicants this would bring in or how many new parcels this would actually open up for cultivation? Um, with regard to the eligibility restrictions, staff doesn't have data they feel comfortable that that's, you know, we can make assumptions on. It would be just that assumptions. Um, so that... Uh, I mean, is it, I mean, it's true that one of the reasons we're trying to beat the July 1st date is because of the CEQA exemption. Is, I mean, is there a concern then with staff that some of these would have unavoidable and mitigatable environmental impacts then if we didn't do it by July 1st? Some of what's being proposed, if you can't say how many new applicants it'll bring in or how many new parcels, wouldn't that potentially have significant environmental impacts in some areas in the county? I, I think the um, reducing the eligibility restrictions would be most applicable to um, honing in actually just on the CA zone as that was staff's understanding of the board's original intentions is to get people out of the mountains and into the CA zone. So I think if we could um, decrease eligibility restrictions for people who want to pursue commercial cannabis cultivation in the CA zone, it would be an appropriate path forward. And staff understands that the 
current situation has driven many of our local operators outside of the county and one of the burdens the county faces is vehicle miles traveled. I mean, it is a huge aspect of living in Santa Cruz County, the traffic, the people driving over the hill or driving to Monterey, and specifically driving to Monterey to pursue commercial cannabis activities. And if we can reduce that burden, I think it aligns with the county's strategic plan and the board's goals of pushing people into the CA zone from who want to cultivate cannabis. Well, if we're trying to push into the CA zone, why would we even consider large A zones, which your own map shows as disproportionately in rural and mountainous areas in the county? Why would we even open that up as possibility? Well, s staff didn't want to provide any recommendation to that because it's very sensitive. And but it, it was brought up. I mean, let's be it, honest. It, I mean, to be fair, there might not be a recommendation, but it's being presented. And that creates an expectation within the community that this is something that's being seriously considered. I mean, to me, that's a de facto recommendation. The board had a pretty significant discussion about whether A would be considered. Uh, um, to be fair, a lot before your time, Sam. I mean, yes, I, yeah. yes, I know. So this isn't on you specifically, but, but I, I think that the A zone component is a pretty major shift. Um, that if we're really, we need, we should be consistent. If, if the board, as you're saying, wanted CA, then we should get rid of these other elements that uh, are such as A that are being proposed uh, or being considered. So I, I, I consider that kind of. Uh, incongruent. Actually, I would argue that it's against A zoning in general, which the difference between CA and A is that it doesn't allow commercial activity, and by default, this is actually commercial zoning, so I don't even honestly know why this is before us for consideration. Um, th there's two elements on, on here that it speaks about, uh, bringing in new licenses as well as fiscal sustainability. Uh, if we're going to argue fiscal solvency or sustainability, maybe the CAO would have a comment on this. Do we have any sense of how many new applications would be necessary for that to actually be the case and would this actually do it? It's stated as a goal specifically in the staff report. Melody Serino, Deputy CAO. Um, originally, when we did the budget projections for this current fiscal year, we anticipated 150 licensees being licensed to support the um, operations for this fiscal year. So um, I would say anywhere, depending again on how, how the program establishes itself, at least 150 licenses are necessary to make the program fiscally solid without any general fund support. And we're unsure whether this would do that? Uh, we are not, on, we are not sure that this will do that. Okay. All right. Um, so I'll just move down the list as originally Supervisor Coonerty actually wanted us to do, but on the differentiation of canopy limits, uh, we had pretty extensive discussion regarding coastal zone development and no new development, and so we just banned it out. Um, and while I recognize that this would be conversion of existing structures around, you wouldn't allow it to be take ag land or production, and so it'd be on disturbed land. In theory, you could turn an ancillary ag use, which is disturbed lands, pretty generally and pretty broad, actually, it was defined in our ag code as, as ancillary use, mm -hmm. and build new structures, correct? I mean, not just rehab a structure, but build a new structure, say, on a parking lot, for example. One of the things that the industry has said repeatedly is that um, because of the regulations on this market, they would anticipate that a lot of players will fall out over a short amount of time as new competition occurs, not just throughout the state, but throughout the country. Uh, one of the things that we had with NAFTA and CAFTA was the, the collapse of the flower market. Therefore, we have all these empty greenhouses. I mean, I would be concerned about allowing new construction even on outside of uh, the coastal zone at all. If what the industry is saying is true, then therefore I should also assume that we'd have a lot of empty buildings that would be associated with this at all. So. Um, why would we be encouraging uh, new construction versus just, say, the remodeling of existing structures, which was something we'd encourage in the coastal zone? Um, well, we would not, staff's not recommending um, these additional, this redevelopment recommendation inside the coastal zone or the CZ plus one. It'd be the CA zone outside of that, right? I, right. Um, and the costs associated with the redevelopment, the time, the level of professionalism um, are very significant. For instance, a small building, um, approximately 5,000 square feet, average industry cost to um, rehab an existing building for cultivation um, is about $1 million. So if people have the money and are willing to take the uh, risk, we feel, staff feels it's appropriate to allow those people to develop 
on areas where there's no additional takes of land. And we don't feel that this will be a large influx, but we have received projections um, from companies who are looking to redevelop our CA zone lands, <coughs> one of which um, is a, a registrant who wanted to develop an existing mushroom farm. The registrant owns the property. Um, it's small, less than 10 acres, I'll say. And the projections from the registrant were very conservative. They assumed an average market rate of $1,200 per pound of indoor cultivated cannabis. And their um, projected tax revenues from that one operation uh, were $2.5 million to, to mm -hmm. the fund. And those types of economic benefits, I believe, are within the county strategic plan goals to provide jobs like that and to have those economic benefits. I don't see how the it's a goal of the county to dissuade people to not impact soils, but to redevelop existing infrastructure. Just to take a step back, it was never the county's stated goal on cannabis production as, as economics as our primary. It was environment, neighborhood uh, protections, and then initially on the medical side, it was to, prefer, to provide access. Now is to provide a bright line and clarity on this. So uh, this new fascination on the economic side, I recognize and respect that's the CAO's thing. That, that was never actually the board's directed goal. So uh, irrespective of the strategic plan as a sort of apparent thing, when we're specific to this issue, I think it's important that, um, and I think actually the, the electorate would care more about the environment and neighborhood impacts before they would care about the economic benefits of something individually. They've been showing that on every other thing, every other industry that we have. Uh, but I, I, I just want to state that I'm, I'm a little concerned that it's, it, it sounds like the language is shifting about what the goals, the, the board's primary goals were, and I, don't, I didn't think that that was actually a primary goal. But so I've, I've, I've expressed a lot, of, a lot of concern. I don't have any concerns on the advertising, by the way. Uh, <laughs> But, but, I, but I have concerns about these other issues, and, and, um, and I appreciate the answers. It sounds like there's still, though, that's a lot unknown. And so you're asking, I mean, not, you're not asking, but you're providing the board the opportunity to uh, consider a lot of changes where we don't actually know what the end result will continue to be. And I think that that's concerning uh, on a lot of elements for my district. Um, in regard to your uh, concerns associated with the redevelopment and neighborhood concerns, uh, I believe that those concerns would be mitigated through the use permit process, as all, any of these developments will require um, a use permit, will go through the public process. There'll be over 2,000 square feet of development, uh, which will trigger a level five use permit, full zoning administrator hearing, <coughs> and provide notification to the people surrounding it. Additionally, you won't have impacts to agricultural vistas or things like that, as our planning department will make sure, will ensure to mitigate those um, development associated risk. Thanks, I appreciate it. All right, uh, so my turn, and um, then I look forward to hearing public comments. So I guess I'd say, um, from a big picture point of view, I expected at this point that we would have moved more than 100 grows out of the mountains and into the CA zones. And the fact that that hasn't happened is a problem. Uh, and I would expect, I, would, I was expecting millions of dollars in tax revenue, and as I said time and time again, I'm not interested in having the tax revenue in order to fund a cannabis licensing office or an enforcement program. My interest was in having uh, revenue to fund early childhood programs and other programs that are desperate parks, other things that are needed in this community. So I'm interested in figuring out how we get back to where we thought uh, we'd be. I, let me just say for myself, I thought I was fully supportive of a nurse, the nursery and canopy uh, and processing elements um, at at the time had they been brought forward, but uh, staff made a compelling case at the time that it was to be too difficult to implement. Uh, so now I appreciate that we've now had a year experience and we should look at making those changes. Um, similarly, uh, we've looked at advertising uh, and so that leaves, um, which I think is fine, and then I think, so what that leaves is the eligibility piece and the A zone piece. Um, like others, I need more time to understand the impacts of the A zone proposal. Um, from the eligibility piece, we actually talked about having a second round, and my question for you is, I, I believe in the motion at the time, we said in a second round, we would have a preference for underrepresented communities, minority and women-owned business, and so, if we are expanding eligibility, would those would we have a process by which we would have a preference uh, for uh, minority and women-owned businesses? 
I believe that preference would be achieved through um, 7.136, the equity program piece, which um, staff has previously committed to bringing back to you on May 14th. We've uh, deferred on that item because the state is changing what it means to be an equity program. So I believe that we could incorporate that um, preference within 7.136. Okay. My only concern is that with that, we're relying on the state program that may or may not change and may or not be applicable applicable to our county. And so if we're having, if we're, to Supervisor Leopold's point, if we have a queue, maybe in that queue we give preference uh, to to minority and women-owned businesses um, to have their to have their determinations made first or early within the purview within the limits of, of law but I think um, certainly in federal contracting and other processes there are these preferences and so I'd be interested in since that was a direction of the board for a second round I think that that would be um, we should look at it. And so overall, I appreciate what, what you're trying to do, and I think, um, I think many of these, we should be moving in this direction because we should be farther down the road than we are today, uh, and I'm interested in making it simpler for people to comply by rules. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask members of the public to speak to us. There, I noticed there are some members of the public who spoke to us during public comment about this item, so I ask you not to speak again, but if you're here uh, and would like to comment, please come forward. Good afternoon. And thank you for your service, as always. Uh, it's much appreciated. And Sam, I, I thought uh, his uh, delivery notwithstanding, I think that the report was pretty comprehensive. <laughs> and uh, well thought through. Uh, I'm Jim Coffus from Ben Lomond, for the record. And um, as far as the recommend, as, as the points that he made that could result in some uh, potential changes to uh, the ordinance, um, Green Trade supports all of them. Um, we, we, we believe that anything that the county can do to align more closely with the state uh, makes it a lot easier for everybody in the, in the long run. And so um, most of those uh, recommendations regarding canopy and nursery license in particular have been things that we've uh, advocated for quite a while. Uh, there's a few quick things that I'd like to ask about. Uh, uh, Supervisor Friend, I'm glad to hear you say that it's never been a stated goal that economic development was a piece of the puzzle. And I think that that explains the, the dilemma that we're in now, because we've always looked at this as a uh, public safety and law enforcement issue and never as an economic uh, driver. Uh, and as a consequence, we are sitting here uh, a year and a half after state legalization, five years after first discussing this, and we still have yet to license a single uh, cultivator or manufacturer in the county. So, uh, you know, the basic math is three to two, and I think that uh, there's been two supporters on this board, Supervisor Leopold and Supervisor McPherson, who have understood the economic impact and the importance it is for the community. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Coffis, just uh, as you, as a representative of the Green Trade Organization, if, uh, is there, would there be any concern that you would know about this question of registrants and then opening it up to new people and whether there would be perceived that they jumped ahead even though there's other people have been waiting? Well, less than 10% of your original registrants have uh, even begun the process. So, uh, I, you know, I think that uh, more registrants would be, uh, that be something we support, uh, opening it up to everyone, particularly given that CA uh, properties, which we assumed were going to be the place where people uh, would be able to cultivate in the county, uh, there hasn't been much interest uh, there. So yeah, more written, okay. more Thank open. You. I Thank appreciate you. it. Afternoon, Supervisors. Um, my name is Trent McNair. I'm a commercial ag parcel owner and currently have a 
license uh, in, in Lola as a co-location agreement going on right now. Um, I just wanted to say I do support all of the um, proposals that were brought today for the most part. Um, I think that um, we need uh, to move forward with some of these changes so that some more um, people who are working hard to be models for cannabis uh, cultivation, manufacturing, and processing in the county can move forward with um, little less impact and um, keep us from you know being pushed into the illicit market, so to speak, which seems to be the case still. So I just wanted to say um, I, I hope you do consider them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker. Hi, uh, Pat Malo, um, Executive Director, Green Trade, um, formed on former member of the C4, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to start by saying when I go to other places, people say, oh, you're from Santa Cruz. It must be going great. And I don't burst their bubble because I think that sometime we're going to get there. And, you know, I think that Sam had to read fast because there's a lot of stuff in there that we honestly should have gotten right the first time and that honestly, you know, need to happen right away. Um, one issue that I think that is essential and that we've already touched on is, you know, this question of registrants. Um, you know, this room was packed to the brim with registrants hearing that their registration would no longer be valid unless they did some, got the first steps in, <clears throat> application in with cannabis licensing by June 7th. So we need to find some solution to this, uh, whether it's going to be offer the same, you know, extension that we've offered to, you know, the owners of commercial ag properties, that they don't have to have registrations to the owners of any el eligible parcel or extend the current registrations as well as open it up. But I think the real crisis is we're going to have hundreds and hundreds of folks whose registrations won't be valid anymore. And then this question of who's a registrant and who's not is over. So we need to solve that problem you know, today, and I think that people are looking at their clocks, you know, I know there's a lot of appointments coming in, but I think that they're looking at their calendar and say, we don't have enough time left to do this. And so there's a bunch of big structural issues why we've only, we've had more warrants than licenses after legalization. Um, you know, every day I try to be proud, but you know, at a lot of these moments, I'm really ashamed of my piece of the part of this puzzle because we've put out of business the biggest industry in town. So thank you. Hi, Darren Story, uh, commercial agricultural operator in South County. Uh, we support most of staff's recommendations, in particular streamlining the use permitting process. There's already considerable burdens regulatory at the local and state level that we have to abide by and put considerable investment into. And streamlining this process will not only allow us to start meeting these compliance and um, regulatory restrictions, but also be able to start co-locating and bringing in other operators so we will see more movement and we'll see more licensing and we'll see people hopefully coming back from Monterey County and doing it right in Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Robert Kitayama. We're uh, with Kitayama Brothers. We're greenhouse growers in South County. And I did want to thank the supervisors because last summer uh, we were told about the co-location um, ability for large greenhouses to be able to use to expand past the 22,000 square feet. So immediately from, I believe, last July, we started the process of the co-location. And we've been greenhouse growers in this county for 50 years, and we've never uh, seen any process that took as much effort as this has. I mean, I respect our uh, partners, but I have now a land use consultant, I have cannabis lawyers, I have engineers, I have architects, we need odor mitigation. Um, I believe the reason why there are only seven applicants is because the hoops and the cost are out of the range of of applicants beyond large customers like ours. We are fortunate. Uh, we have heard now that, and we are, we are moving this. We are flower growers where every day I spend more time on cannabis than I do on cut flowers. And we have now been told that probably the process will take us till September, November. And, and I, I believe we are the ones moving the fastest in the county. So if you, if 
plus that, then we also have to get into the process where we will lease to uh, good tenants, and then their process of trying to get a cultivation license, uh, don't know how long that's gonna take them. That might take them three, six, eight months. So we wanna move this industry. We wanna be a good corporate citizen. We have been. I think we've been good land stewards. We will continue to be good land stewards in South County. Um, but I just encourage you. We have a lot of competitors in the flower business who are now growing in Monterey, Santa Barbara, other counties who are moving much faster than we are. I, we lost a good tenant proposal, a big Dutch company. They went to San Mateo, which, which kills me. <laughs> anyway, so thank you. Uh, Mr. Kitayama. Mr. Kiyama, could you just, you mentioned that, that you're moving as quickly as possible, but you're not, you may not get something until September or later than that. What's the reasoning? So there's a lot of work that, that goes into this. We, again, we've had to um, do lots of work as far as with the planning department. You know, we've submitted once, they send us back uh, issues that we have to address. There's issues such as odor mitigation that there really is not a lot of technology out there. Um, and so we've had to do a lot of research on that. There was a huge issue around fire sprinklers that took quite a while to uh, address that issue. And then now we've resubmitted and we hear that this hearing uh, process, because it's a level five, might take one, two, three, four, five months. So that's the one that I believe if we can move to a level three to move this along. And there are a lot of eyes on us. And we do want to be um, a good example for the county, for the state. We welcome anyone to come in at any time to view what we're doing. Um, but, but if we can move that along, that would be, that would be a great advantage uh, for us moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, supervisors. Hello, supervisors. My name is J.R. Richardson, I'm Coastal Nursery, commercial ag owner. And I just want to express my gratitude to you guys. And I wanted to extend my support to Sam. I think he's really done a good job uh, explaining a lot of the issues that are going on with us operators. Uh, it's been a pretty burdensome process, but again, we are very appreciative to actually be one of the seven applicants that are moving forward with this process. I think that um, moving it from a five to a three would help um, issues that you brought up, um, Ryan, that are, you know, based at you know addressing bringing those hundreds of people out of the mountains that we've kind of originally were looking at doing. And uh, I think that the burdensome process that we're having is like drawing that process out. Sorry, I'm a little nervous of public speaking, but thank you. You're doing well. Good afternoon. My name is Robin Bolster Grant, former county employee. Um, and I also uh, applaud the work that, that Sam has done and the whole team in coming up with some ideas that will help uh, move things along. I know uh, from personal experience how challenging that is. I, I particularly support uh, the efforts to reduce the, the level of review for CA. Um, that's certainly a, a sticking point. Um, I also uh, agree that uh, eliminating the, the registration requirement uh, is, is time. I think the registration process served its purpose of the 400 some odd folks that are still in the system. I suspect a very small fraction of those folks will end up actually um, coming in and, and completing the, the, the process. The fact that we're nearing the one year point after adoption of the non-retail uh, uh, licensing program with zero licenses to show for it uh, indicates that there are some fundamental problems getting folks across the finish line. We currently have five paid county staff working on enforcement. We have one staff member dedicated to processing pre-applications. We have no dedicated planners in the planning department. I know the budget issues are, are serious. I know that the licensing office um, is, is underwater, but I think that that represents a fundamental disproportion in, in, in approach and in, in how we're dealing with this. I would respectfully ask that, that consideration be given to filling the vacant planner position in the licensing office and ideally um, providing a dedicated planner in the planning department. Um, I would also encourage uh, more frequent uh, policy meetings. 
I know Sam and I have talked, I think currently they, um, uh, Sam meets with the planners, uh, I believe once a month, or twice a month, I'm sorry. Um, I would encourage more collaboration. I think the policy issues that come up are keeping people from moving forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors, uh, staff, um, Jonathan Kolodinsky, and um, I just wanted to take a moment and express my gratitude uh, to you and your service to our county, um, and it's with the utmost commitment and respect to environmentalism and uh, community concerns that I'm here today, um, and I trust in the wisdom and guidance in the domain of your authority and the authority of the Cannabis Licensing Office that's worked really hard to make this program work. It's interesting to be having this conversation 10 years later, and I'm excited to still be here with everyone. I agree with the CLO and Super Leopold's recommendations to streamline the process and reduce to a level three on the CA zone lands. If I heard it correctly, I think that that makes sense. Um, and I agree that the CLO is working hard to make things happen. Um, and as one of the few operators in good standing, I agree with his suggestions. Let's have faith in the abilities of the county staff that's been delegated the task at hand to take on this difficult task. And as a South County resident, I'm looking forward to the tax revenue that these businesses will provide. On my drive to drop the kids off at school today, I lost count of the potholes after I hit 100. And at two points along the way, the road is completely washed out beyond the yellow line in the middle. Um, and so it's uh, apparent to me that um, our county infrastructure needs attention, especially in the South County, where I think, um, as you mentioned, there's somewhat of a disproportionate um, shift of the cannabis businesses. And I'm looking forward to seeing some more economics coming out of the South County to support all of the rural infrastructure that's needed uh, for uh, myself and the rest of the South County residents. Um, you know, the good operators have proven themselves, and I believe that our county tax could really use this revenue. Thank you for your consideration, public service, and wisdom. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Ken Hart. I'm also a former county employee, a land use consultant of late. I represent four of the seven uh, applicants that are in the process, um, all on CA land. Uh, totaling about 1.3 million acres of um, acres square feet of um, of cultivation, um, I do support the reduction of the processing level from a, a five to a three. I think, though, maybe more importantly, is um, as an end user, I see how the process is working, how the comments are being generated. Um, I do think that this strongly. Um, uh, cries out for a more coordinated review process. Um, for instance, having all the, the reviewers, there are not that many projects in the, in the pipeline right now, to have everyone get together in the same place in the same room and go over comments, because I've, I've seen there are a lot of different uh, interpret, interpretive um, uh, matters that come up for each and every department that's reviewing, and to have to then chase those down and resolve them individually is a very time-consuming process. Uh, there are also sometimes uh, requirements from one department that then generate requirements from another department that would have, would not have been required uh, if the the, fo the first department hadn't uh, hadn't had a recommendation or a requirement. So I think a more coordinated processing um, uh, model for these types of applications um, would be probably save more time than the three or so months from um, eliminating the, the public hearing on the, on, the, on the projects. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so that concludes public comment and I'll bring it back to the board for action. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, th uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the uh, testimony today. Um, uh, I, uh, I have a lot of respect for the views of my uh, colleague, and uh, I know we have spent hours on, on discussing the issue of cannabis, uh, sometime from a, a position of uh, little knowledge, sometime from a position of intense uh, scrutiny, uh, uh, sometimes uh, in a situation where we didn't actually know what the state rules would be. Um, 
I appreciate the work that Mr. Laforte is doing uh, because I think he brings uh, a very good perspective uh, about how we work to protect the environment um, and also acknowledge that there's an economic benefit to this. And while, while uh, at the start of this process many years ago, we didn't talk about that very much, at, you know, we did do a uh, draft environmental impact report that showed that this could be a jobs creator. Um, we've seen the, the kind of jobs that, that this business uh, generates. Uh, we can be supportive of that without going against anything that we previously talked about. Um, and, and as my other colleague mentioned, we could uh, be generating taxes uh, that could help out with a lot of uh, critical needs in our community. Um, I don't think that these recommended changes uh, have the same impact that my colleague does um, because they're on uh, commercially ag uh, zone land. They're, uh, with the exception of, uh, of uh, this uh, canopy limits um, and uh, using already disturbed soil, uh, to, to build something new, most of these things don't actually increase the size of, of that impact. They're already in zones that are designed for growing plants. Um, we, should, uh, we should support the growing of plants in those. We should make it, uh, I do believe that our, uh, our policy goal was to try to make it easier on places like commercial ag uh, to grow this plant because that would have the least amount of impacts environmentally, neighborhood, et cetera. And so as uh, now that we have a year's worth of experience um, and we have a better understanding of the, of the regulatory environment at the state level and our own challenges about moving things through the system here, either through staffing or um, as the last speaker meant, just not talking to each other enough, uh, I think it's worthwhile for us to take a look at uh, these changes. Uh, Mr. LaForte, if I understand correctly, um, if we were to ask you to, to draft something up about these recommendations, that would come back to us on May 14th. Um, that, that after that, if we decided we liked them, they would go to the Planning Commission, and then they would come back to us again by June 11th. Yes. Um, 1310 proposed changes would not be presented to the board. They would be presented directly to the Planning Commission. Only 7.128 changes would be presented to the board. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, I, I think that gives plenty of time for us to become better aware and for the community to become better aware and for the industry to become better aware to know what this looked like when we actually write it down, right? And, and instead of just having a rapid fire uh, release of that information. So I'd like to, to, to move that we um, uh, direct our uh, staff uh, to come up with recommendations to bring back to our May 14th meeting um, on the issue of the nursery uh, license canopy definition, eligibility, uh, canopy limits, processing license, advertising, and use permit review. Um, and uh, then uh, uh, we could see then whether we, it's something we want to uh, uh, push forward with the uh, Planning Commission. So I'll second that. Um, I'd also I'd like to add in there additional direction of I'd like a plan from the uh, CLO and the planning department of how we're at 75 licenses by this time next year. So let's let's like focus. Uh, uh, and so <laughs> um, with the idea, um, I mean, I think it's. It's just sort of for any small business, it's unacceptable to have more than a year of uh, permit processing. And then, um, and especially when we're talking about CA where we thought it was gonna be relatively turnkey. Um, so I'd like to plan for whether it's the coordination or resources for how we, how we move this forward as part of a friendly movement. Uh, I'm comfortable with that. Okay, uh, Supervisor Caput. Uh, I wanna thank you for the time and effort you put in uh, studying all this and uh, being able to, uh, you know, answer our questions. Uh, one last question is uh, <clears throat> the fees, uh, license fee, depending on size, they range from what, 2000 to $4,000 for a license? Am I in the ballpark? 
our license fees are currently $2,800 um, for a cannabis business license. The, the differentiation of fees um, is very large at the state level. Um, the state license fees range from $1,200 to $77,000. So uh, the county license fees are, are set and um, we're looking at potentially changing those fees slightly going forward to incorporate some of the compliance costs associated with administering the program, but that, that is for a later date. Okay, when you say changing them, uh, would that be lowering them or raising them? Uh, it, it would be an increase to cover staff's time associated with the compliance program. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other comments? Supervisor Friend? I don't mind uh, voting to have this come back. I think it's pretty clear I'm not, I find it very unlikely I'll be supporting most of the recommendations that do come back. I think some of them are okay. I think some of them are actually larger uh, components, but since what this is today is just moving to have additional information come back, um, I can support that motion, but I, I, do, I do find it unlikely I'll be supportive of some of these things moving forward. Yeah. All right. I, I'm just not exactly sure of what we're voting on here. Right now we're voting. Uh, Supervisor uh, Leopold's motion was to uh, basically have the staff develop proposals uh, and perhaps flush out some of these ideas a little bit more and then return to us, uh, actually go through the planning commission and then return to us with recommendations. And, and that includes all signage and all the other stuff uh, that you mentioned, right? Yeah. The, 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 uh, the, some, of the, some of the elements, maybe uh, Mr. LaForte or, or Mr. Heath would say which pieces would come back to us and which wouldn't. Uh, well, Jason Heath for County Council's office, um, all of the recommendations would come back to you and we would ask for your board's general direction on whether those issues both, um, 7.128 is within your board's totally within your board's discretion. 1310 changes need to go to the Planning Commission, but before we took them to the Planning Commission, we would want to have an indication of whether your board was interested in having those discussions had at all by the Planning Commission. You don't give them direction on what to, what to do, um, but we would know whether it was worthwhile to take them to the Planning Commission. So bottom line is all the recommendations that uh, staff has would be brought to you on May 14th. If your board gives us direction to take 1310 recommendations to the Planning Commission, we would do that, and then the whole package would come back for your board to review on June 11th. And when we get the recommendations uh, back, you'll, you'll make that distinction so we know which one's going to the Planning Commission and which one's staying with us. Yes. Okay, so we have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. All right, uh, we're moving on to item number nine, which is to consider uh, an ordinance repealing the Santa Cruz County Code, Chapter 9.56, abandoned and wrecked vehicles on private and public property, excluding streets and highways, and schedule final adoption for the next available agenda as outlined in the memorandum of the Deputy CAO, Director of Public Works. <laughs> Thank you and good afternoon, Chairman, Supervisors. Uh, this will be relatively brief. So the item before you is consideration to approve and concept a repealing of Ordinance 9.56. Chapter 9.56 of the County Code allows for the removal of abandoned or wrecked vehicles from public or private property. Although the county has an ongoing and successful program for abating abandoned vehicles on public highways and rights of way, there is no current program for doing such on other public or private property, and nor is one contemplated. And so we bring this recommendation to you, and I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, we're, ch we're changing, uh, we're talking about private property then. Right. We're, we're talking about private and public property that are not part of the public right of way. So both private and and uh, public okay. property as well. So if it's uh, public, uh, we would not remove it? So if it were public, what we would do is we would look at the department that's responsible for maintenance of that property and address the concern of that vehicle, whatever that situation is. Okay, and now private property would come under, they could be cited if it's a health issue, rats and uh, leaking oil out of a car. 
even though it's on private property? Right, or if someone were living in it or something like that, then we would address it in those appropriate ways. Or if it were stolen, it could be a criminal investigation. A lot of other opportunities to consider if we're on private property. I think we've all had uh, issues uh, where it comes up, and a couple in my area were, um, it came down to whether or not it looks like the car can actually move. <clears throat> uh, if it doesn't have wheels on it or the, um, uh, the car is there and then the uh, the hood is up and you can see part of the engine missing uh, Is that a citation or? So you're going to get beyond my expertise here really no, fast, no. but I do know that county code does have provisions for uh, vehicles on private property that are not in um, use or stationary for too long especially in say in in uh, parking lots and things of that nature So a lot of that could fall under code enforcement Okay, I, I just want, I, I really respect private property, but at the same time, if there's a neighbor that's ruining the whole neighborhood, we're still able to cite them. Yeah, uh, this, this wouldn't change that, and this is really very specific to um, abandoned and wrecked vehicles. And so a lot of what you're talking about would be uh, negligence in other ways, not truly just abandoned vehicles. We'd still have uh, recourse. That's correct. Okay. All right. Is there any public comment? Uh, I, I just had a question. Sure, Supervisor. Um, the, the, this question, I understand private property. We, we, we tend not to do things on private property. I've uh, had to tell constituents to drag the deer to the public right away so that we can take it away. But um, the public piece, does this happen very often? I mean, do we get, do we get calls? It's, it's quite rare. Uh, I checked in with our staff in Public Works, and we don't have recollection or documentation of any in the past. Uh, so I think it's fairly rare. Yeah, I, 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 um, it, it makes sense to me. I, I, I don't understand what's driving this, but I, uh, um, I'll go along with it. Yeah, I, it, it's happened in my area probably about four times. Yeah, me too. All right, so we got a, uh, we, we're cl okay, we closed public comment. We got a motion by Friend. Second. Second by McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Item number 10 is to consider final appointment of Nanette Mikowitz to the Santa Cruz County Monterey Merced Managed Care Commission as an at-large hospital representative for a term to expire April 1st, 2023. Move approval. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 That passes unanimously. Moving on uh, to item number uh, 11, to consider final appointment of Nicholas uh, Lorig Roach to the Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission as an at-large community representative for a term to expire on April 1st, 2021. Move approval. Move to approve or second, either way. All right, we got a motion by Caput, a second by Leopold. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Consider final appointment of uh, Richard Schmalley to the Housing uh, Authority Board of Commissioners as an at-large tenant representative over 62 years of age for a term to expire May 12th, 2021. Move to approve. Second. All right, that, look at that, right <laughs> off the block. Uh, Supervisor Caput, uh, motion, second by Leopold. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, f opposed, that passes unanimously. Finer, uh, consider a uh, final appointment of Caitlin Brune to the Community Health Center's co-applicant commission as an at-large community representative for a term to expire December 11th, 2022. Move approval. Second. Got a motion by Leopold, a second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 That passes unanimously. Okay. It is uh, 1240. I'm going to ask uh, us to come back at 115 for a closed session uh, agenda, uh, closed session discussion. Uh, and I'm going to ask the uh, county council if there's anything going to be anything reportable. No. Okay. Thank you. What, what is okay with you? What? No, it's uh, 115. 115. Oh, 115. Okay. Yes.